Number 10, Albert. Adam, how is Queen Victoria's marriage to Prince Albert bizarre? Well, my little honeybees, not to be a pessimist, but it's bizarre because they actually really did love each other. Uh? Be honest, how often do you think it occurred that people of royal or noble birth actually got to marry someone they genuinely loved? On February 10th, 1840, Queen Victoria married Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg Gotha, who, interestingly, was her first cousin and who was actually kind of not the favorite of the British people who saw him as an outsider. As queen, she was the one to propose. Good for you, queen. Literally. The couple stayed married for 21 years until Albert died of typhoid in 1861. And together, the couple had nine children. Nine. Even after his death, Queen Victoria continued to make ruling decisions based on the principle of what would Albert do? It's such a nice way to start this heinous list. Number nine, Napoleonic Wars. Okay, a little bit of a stretch, but I would argue the Victorian era lasted from about 1814 to 1914. There's no specific date, but it could be classified around this time. The Napoleonic Wars were essentially world wars started by one man, the Corsican Ogre. Hello. Imagine having the whole world against you. No, really, the whole world against you. Britain, Prussia, Russia, Austria, and sometimes Italy took part in the coalition wars, which were just part of Napoleon's story. Trust me, this dude was arrogant and he was the antagonist of the story. He's been labeled as the greatest tactician ever. When it was all said and done, he had rediscovered ancient Egypt, fought many battles, and managed to become emperor. And he got banished twice. Eight, mummy unwrapping parties. What is your favorite idea of a get together? Let me know down below, I won't judge, I promise. Unless, of course, you say mummy unwrapping parties like some people in the Victorian era might have. Then I will indeed judge you. Thanks to the Napoleonic Wars making their way to Egypt, interest in the country was on the up and up. And while people have been buying mummies since the Elizabethan era, now these rich weirdos bought even more, bringing them back as souvenirs. Once they got to the homestead, they would almost instantly hold parties with all their rich friends where they would unwrap their mummies like a Christmas present. Congratulations! It's exactly what you thought it would be! A five or six thousand year old decaying corpse that smells horrible. Why are rich people like this? I, I don't get it. Number seven, Fire Hazard Christmas. Like all families at Christmas, we all have our traditions. I'm a good boy all year, so Santa can bring me lots of gifts. Thanks, Santa. My family tradition is to watch the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation every year. I love that movie. Adam, on the other hand, well, he's a bad boy, and he eats all the chocolate out of his advent calendar before it's time. Don't tell him I said anything, though. I can't help it. I'm sorry. He's right there. However, one family Christmas tradition was quite popular back in Victorian times, oftentimes called Snapdragon. Uh, the basis of this game was to get a large bowl, fill it with dad's brandy, and drop some large raisins in said bowl. Next, get a candle or a match and uh, light it up. Now that there's a large cauldron of flaming liquid and fireballs in your living room, now your objective is to try and knock the raisins out of the dish without getting burned. Fun for the whole family, why not? Just be mindful, you know, that the whole house is made of wood and there's no fire alarms and there's no modern firefighting equipment and everyone's wearing long gowns and you get the point. Number six, maybe we were apes? November 24th, 1859 marks the day that none other than Charles Darwin published the famous and even infamous On the Origin of Species, presenting his theory of natural selection and questioning the theory of creation. Truly a great day in my opinion. Look, we can talk evolution versus creation in the comments, but there is no denying the evidence presented in On the Origin of Species had people turning heads and questioning everything they thought they knew. Its full title, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life kind of explains it. But basically, Charles' book gave us the idea that species evolve over generations through the process of natural selection, which he backed up with evidence from the Beagle Expedition in the 1830s, which to my disappointment had nothing to do with the dog breed beagles. Number five. Burke and Hare. Medical schools were offering a handsome fee for deceased bodies to study. This was, this is an odd time. So an unhealthy amount of Victorians came up with this new solution. They thought they were brilliant. Yeah, they would rob graves. They would just go and rob the freshest graves they could find. They would wait in the bushes until the funeral's over and then they would go and 
disgusting. It got so out of hand that family members were actually guarding the graves of recently deceased overnight. That's how bad it got. That's disgusting. But nobody goes down in history like William Burke and William Hare. They were an unlikely duo, to say the least. They wouldn't wait until the body was done living. You know what I mean? They would actually kill people and rush the process, all for a pretty penny. 16 victims in total between 1827 and 1828. It took 16 victims for people to start catching on to this weird plan. The pair would lure victims into their house, fill them with alcohol, and then they would suffocate them. They had a sick system and they would suffocate them because the body needed to be in the best condition possible in order to receive a payout from the Edinburgh University Medical School. So they would, you know, try and keep it as clean as possible, which is horrible to say, but it makes sense. The Anatomy Act in 1832 put an end to this horrific plan. Number four, bird hats. Look, I don't have much to say about this next one here because, well, all right, yeah. I love a good hat. I've worn a few hats here throughout my time on bumblebee, some baseball caps, some beanies here and there, sure. I've never worn a dead bird on my hat though, and I don't think that I will. That's for certain, I might just leave that out. Taxidermy was a hot topic back in Victorian London. Folks would rock the dead beaver bowler hat, any animal they would just prop up there, and it was considered fashion at the time, believe it or not. It was a dangerous trend though, long-term. Conservationists were saying that 67,000 species of birds were all at risk of extinction due to this crazy dead bird hat craze. Can you imagine just a stuffed seagull on my hat? I'm like, all right, number five, here we go. It's crazy. Also, that's like a lot of weight, you know what I mean? A lot of weight on your head, just kind of, oh sorry, there's just a dead pigeon on my head, so my neck's kind of sore. What if the wings opened up and you kind of just like got some air? Maybe that's why they did it. Number three, holiday cards. Today, these Hallmark holiday cards, they go way too hard. And they also have a card for everyone and everything, you name it. Birthdays, weddings, stepdad's name day, you're like, what? That's so specific. Like they have everything covered, but back in the 1800s, these holiday cards, they were brand new. Nobody knew what to write or say, so they would just end up sending these artistic sentimental scenes. It would be like a frog in a top hat riding a bike. No caption, just that. You'd be like, hey, Merry Christmas, I guess. It'd be like a carrot with a face. It'd be a haunting image, really, to receive from a loved one on Christmas, but it's the thought that counts, I guess. This holiday season, just give your parents a card with this on it and then see what they do. Don't even write anything. Just stare at them in the corner, all Victorian-like, and be like, Mother, father, Merry Fortnite Christmas. I don't know what they would say. Number two, lots of arsenic. We of course have to mention a big problem in the 1800s. Arsenic, everywhere, all at once, okay? Skin lotion, tons of cosmetics, it was a nightmare. Even if you didn't use any facial cream or anything, it was everywhere else. It was in wallpaper, it was in dresses, it was in toys, medicine. My gosh, it really was horrible, it's a nightmare. And it's because arsenic was cheap at the time. It was during the Industrial Revolution. It was being unearthed more and more and finally, come 1851, the Arsenic Act was passed, which fixed a lot of issues. Yeah, we regulated that one not soon enough, but we definitely got that one fast. And finally, number one, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, we've got to end on a horrific note. Everybody's just finding out now about Jeffrey Dahmer, it seems. He's a hot topic on Netflix. But what about Jack the Ripper? How did he get away with it this entire time? Why aren't we going to see a Netflix doc on him? Ever. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily targeting sex workers in the area. Now, at the time, the murders of five women from August to November of 1888 were believed to have been connected somehow to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active even until 1891. Again, we're never gonna know at this point. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims. I can't really say anything else because it's disgusting, but yeah, he knew some things, disgustingly. And while there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was still never identified. Number 10, Queen Victoria's passing. Some say it ended the Victorian era, but it actually kind of extended a little while past that. She was the longest reigning queen at the time and a symbol of Great Britain's power. She also wasn't the nicest. Uh, she oversaw the conquering of India, which pretty bad. The special flower wars in China, which saw China give five of its major cities to the British Empire, <laughs> including Hong Kong, which kind of an awkward one there too. So yeah, her passing was sad for most, but for others, especially foreign nations, it was a reminder that their brutal overseers are still there and they're probably still gonna rule for another like 70 years. Oof. Number nine, World War One. 
This is considered to be the end of the Victorian era, and it makes sense, especially the first half of the war. It was a mixture of old world versus new world. Horses and cavalry swords versus Germans in trenches with large rapid fire blam blams. In Great Britain and of course other European nations, they were foaming at the mouth to attack each other. However, culturally speaking, they were the same since Victoria had passed. Not much had changed. However, after her passing, and of course after the war, big changes, huge changes. So much so that it changed the world and in different ways in different countries. We need a whole list to go over that, but empires fell, America got rich, and they went back fighting shortly 20 years later. It was kind of awkward. Number eight, stiff photographs. For some strange reason, people in the Victoria era were like the grandfathers of all goth kids. Any obsession people have today with the strange and unnatural, well, you can partially thank the Victorians. A good example of their obsession with the weird and oddities is post-mortem photographs. Yikes, yes. Given that photographs were a new and amazing technology, and for the time, yeah, they were, and that people had some less than living relatives lying about, well, it only made sense to capture their memory forever by having their picture taken. Dressed up, prepared, and positioned in many different ways just to bring the mantle by the fireplace together as what would a home be without the post-mortem photographs of your old Aunt Burge? Am I right or am I right? It's weird, I don't know. Number seven, grave robbing. If ladies of the evening and cold-blooded de-lifing have always been a part of life, then so it was grave robbing. The second someone was buried with anything valuable, there's been a creepier person on standby with a shovel. That's just how it goes. Poor Dompe from Zelda. Guy gets a bad rap. This was no different in Victorian times. However, while digging up corpses for baubles and trinkets was certainly done, there was a far more lucrative business, especially for those in the mad scientist business. <laughs> Sorry. People were paid under the coroner's table to dig up cadavers and retrieve them for doctors and medical professionals to conduct all sorts of freaky deaky stuff. Mostly just to learn, but you can be sure someone got a little weird with it. We always do, we always take it too far. Number six, Christmas fire. One of the things my mama always taught me was fire safety. My dad taught me how to deal with a bonfire after 10 beer, but well, mom's lesson was safer. Never leave the stove unattended. Put candles out when you're done and know your fire escape plan. You gotta know it, you never know. While this event may seem like a wholesome family fun on the holidays, I get anxiety just thinking about it. In Victorian times, families would play a game at Christmas called Snapdragon. You get a large dish or bowl or cauldron, I guess, large enough for everyone to gather around the table and fill it with a whole bottle of brandy. Then pour in some dates and large raisins. Then ignite said brandy ablaze and try to grab the blue flaming dates without getting burned. Folks, this is a time before modern firefighting techniques, burn medicine, and houses are just really close together. So one good fire could take down a whole block, maybe a city. Not a good idea, don't do this, don't recommend. Look, Mom, I got the flaming raisin, and now the curtains are on fire, wow! Number five, the potato famine. Potatoes have been a staple of many cultures' cuisines for centuries, partially because of their ruggedness, easy to grow attitude, and not only filling, but very delicious. Ooh, let me some fries. Good box of hot fries and some salt, baby. Let's go. Well, 1845 Ireland was a wee bit different as a fungus outbreak was taking hold of the mighty potato harvest all over the country, thus creating a large famine that would see one million people or more perish in a large famine. Queen Victoria tried to help but was extremely ineffective and by help, well, I mean the same effort I put into reading books assigned to me in high school. Sorry, Miss Middleton, I used Cliff Notes. I'm sorry, I did. I used, I'm sorry, I love you, Miss Middleton, you're the best. But I read like 10 pages out of the book, so that's gotta count for something, right? Right? Number four, the Napoleonic Wars. Like World War I, this time can be stretched to include Victorian England. Why is this event so dark? Well, because Napoleon wasn't going to stop. France had recently discovered what freedom was, and sacre bleu, it tastes amazing. <laughs> and they overthrew their government. Napoleon surprised everyone by being an amazing general. Dude took on multiple nations at once, and won multiple times. It's extremely impressive. However, in a classic case of went to his head, he became the leader of France and declared himself the first consul of France, or emperor in other terms, and started stripping away rights, especially from women, which sucks, like a construction worker who kicks off his boots at 5pm. 
I know you're out there. You guys just, you just kick them off. Just get rid right of them. Those boots, they're stinking. He invaded other European nations and was on a path to destruction until the international community put, him to, put, put a stop to it. They said no more, dude. Number three, dirty. It's dirty, isn't it? Oh, it's dirty. It should be noted that the streets of Victorian London were not clean at all. Maybe the filthiest, maybe the filthiest ever. It was so bad that in 1858, the Great Stink occurred, which basically was all the refuse and filth piling up in the River Thames. Combined with a heat wave in the summer, the issue had literally been mounting for years and now would come to an offensive bubbling over. Oh, that must be awful. The smell was so bad it was making people sick and people were most likely getting sick from the river from cholera outbreaks. God, that's disgusting. Cholera was more common than you'd like to think. It took some serious engineering and a lot of pumps to fix the sewage issue that was severely outdated. It wasn't fully fixed until 1875. Keep your soap and your hand sanitizing here, my folks. It's gonna be a little greasy. Number two, ladies of the evening. Oh yes, the streets of Victorian England were filthy, all right. And if every street corner was a lovely lass furloughing her dress in hopes of luring in a customer, as they say, oh yes, she shan't have to wait long, as this type of business was more common and profitable back then than you'd really like to think. Personally, I don't see why it is illegal or still is, especially if it becomes regulated. I mean, why not? Let, let them do what you gotta do. However, it was bad. There was a lot of sickness and bedroom related sicknesses. It wasn't good, it was horrible. I just fell off the box. Sorry, I'm an idiot. Number one, Jack the Ripper. Oh. Not much I can say about this guy that YouTube won't let me say, so here we go. The first serial unaliver to do what they do in the pale moonlight. The streets of Victorian London were crowded, dirty, like I said, and oftentimes chaotic. So for a true psychopath like Jack to exist only makes sense. He was kind of a ghost. He was responsible for the passing of several women who worked the streets and, uh, well, they were really violent crimes. We can't show you, but we'll show you a picture of Jack in a cloak or something, maybe in the moonlight or something like that. The worst part is he was never caught, like ever. Not, they, we don't, we never got him. Or he was a she, or he was multiple people. We, we just don't know. There's many theories, but because of technology at the time and, and crime solving things, we just, we just didn't, we, we didn't get him. Number 10, mudlarks. Victorian London, around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. You know, a lot of sore throats, that's for sure. Everybody was sick all the time and the jobs that were available certainly did not help the cause. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. As their name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the muck that builds up alongside the Thames River. This one was reserved for younger folks, obviously, because it was like working in quicksand. If you were older, you would just get trapped. It was pretty sad. It was also exhausting, not to mention the chances of being washed away by the river were pretty high. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch, driftwood, rags, anything really worth your troubles. Number nine, chimney sweep. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house every now and then, whatever, and I personally, I loved it. You know, I thought I was the father of the house for a bit, getting in the chimney, getting all dirty and stuff doing this, my hands on my on my waist. I don't know, it's, that's, that's what a man was when I was younger. That little broom too, I love that little broom. I remember when I would do this, my grandmother, who is very English, she would be shook. She would watch the entire time. She would be taken back into time because this was a terrible job to have in Victorian London. I was, yeah, it was not the same at all. Chimney sweeps were famously young. I can't say anything else there in regards, but yeah, they were, we lads, to say the least. History is horrible. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that then made it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and then clean a chimney. Thank, thank God, I'm glad that stopped. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea I could have used this great law. Been like, actually, mother, a lot of claws. Number eight, funeral mute. Funerals suck, man. I was a pallbearer like three times before the age of 21. My one arm is just strong as fuck now, that's it. I can lift anything just with one arm. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, right? Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Oliver Twist, one of those lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Funeral mutes were required to dress in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would essentially be to stand and mourn silently at the door of the recently deceased home. Yeah, 
guy dies of a plague and you're like standing there like holding your breath like great this is the worst job ever you would then lead the coffin to the graveyard so a lot of responsibility yeah don't trip or breathe number seven toilet troubles now the victorian era was unsanitary to say the least but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect right go to the bathroom and may not come out one of the greatest victorian inventions was that of the bathroom but it took a few tries to figure out the whole you know methane gas problem we got a really deal with that one first and foremost. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common. This would, uh, this is how, every time you take a shit, you were worried that you might just, woo, that was horrible, that's so scary. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time with human waste. Human, a, a, a lot of human waste. Built up in the sewers and then eventually would back up into your homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and your bathroom's gone. Just like that. Now we have poo-pourri. You know what that is? You ever see a little spray? And after you go, you just, you hide what you've done with one little spray at your friend's house. It's fascinating how far we've come. Number six, stairs. Yeah, believe it or not, stairs were a common danger in Victorian times. I'm somebody personally who falls up and down stairs a lot. I'm 6'2", I'm lanky as shit. I have like a Gumby body. I walk around like Woody. I'm always falling up and down stuff. It's horrible, especially in Canada. It's so slippery. I'm always, always slipping all the time. In Victorian times, I would have been doomed. Houses were thrown up comedically fast. There wasn't a Mike Holmes on Holmes to come in and check it out. There wasn't a building inspector that made things, you know, safe. Servant staircases, they were tiny. They were out of sight. They were built into these narrow walls, often missing steps that they had to and cut corners just to, you know, be narrow and out of the way. That plus a tray of hot soup and a lot of clothing, yeah, it was next to impossible to move around without something happening. A lot of fatalities and staircases. Even today, around 12,000 people die each year falling downstairs. Hold on to that railing. I'm here to remind you to hold on to that railing. Crazy. There's actually no stairs there. I just made that whole thing up. Hit that like button for magic. Number five, the potato famine. The potato, so rugged, so versatile. Think of all the ways you can prepare a potato. Boiled, broiled, baked, mashed, pan fried, deep fried, french fries, hash browns, latkes, and sometimes you can put them in soup or stew. Usually pretty cheap and filling. The food of peasants and I love it. However, during 1845 Ireland, a fungus outbreak was taking hold of potato harvest all over the country. Thus creating a large famine that would see over one million people perish in a famine. Queen Victoria tried to help but was ineffective. And by help, I mean the same effort I put into reaching for the TV remote that's too far away on a lazy Sunday. Number four, body snatching. Look, back in the day, making a buck was not so easy. Some people who had absolutely no morals went this route. Basically, you wait around for a recently vacant grave to be not vacant. And before the soil can settle, you remove the inhabitant of said grave and go to your local university and say, Right, I've got this here fresh non-mangled corpse. Give me some money and it's all yours. And Bob's your uncle, you are now the very bottom of the barrel, the tritus of human existence. But hey, you made some moolah and can afford to eat your next meal. Honestly, while you may be the worst of the worst people, it's partially the doctors and schools that are to blame for even accepting these fresh, illegally exhumed corpses for study in the first place. It may not sound like a specific event, but um, some people dressed up for it, so there's that. Number three, the tube in it. The London Underground, baby, the world's first subway, which let me tell you, it's kind of annoying living in Canada when you have two very popular franchises that share two common names for a rapid underground train, Metro and Subway, right? It's so annoying. You Google Metro and Subway and then the grocery store comes? I never have that. Okay. It's, maybe it's that, a me thing. A it's a me thing. Tunnels underneath the city and trains travel through it. It's simple. Well, the first one was opened in 1863, which is an engineering feat to say the least. And it feels like forever ago. I mean, that's older than Canada for crying out loud. When you think of the Victorian era, you think horses, carriages, top hats, and orphans asking for more gruel. Mind you, the locomotive was different from a modern one, but this is a very modern idea, especially considering that there's no cars yet. Kind of a weird thing. Number two, the telephone. On March 7th, 1876, Scotsman Alexander Graham Bell got a patent for his invention of the telephone. Three days after acquiring the patent, Mr. Bell made his first phone call to his assistant, Thomas A. Watson, saying, Watson, come here, I want to see ya. And that was that. And we've gone downhill ever since. 
No, I'm, I'm just kidding. The telephone is a huge groundbreaking invention allowing people to communicate across vast distances. But the phone addiction some of us have to deal with now, man it's rough. Alexander Graham Bell was born in Edinburgh, Scotland and the whole reason he became interested in the idea of creating the telephone was because of his mother who was deaf and his father Alexander Melville Bell who was a teacher of elocution and was famous for the phonetic transcription system he had developed to help the deaf learn to speak which is really quite sweet actually. Number 1 The War to End All Wars out of all my research about the Victorian era, the start was somewhat muddy. Maybe because historians don't want to take away from North American or Napoleon history. But the end of the Victorian era was more clear. 1914, the war to end all wars. This was the big one folks. A mixture of militarism, imperialism, alliances and a power struggle uh, made for a powder keg that ended up exploding in 1914. Unlike a lot of wars, this one actually changed things. Empires fell while others got stronger. Countries on maps were being redrawn. Others stayed the same. But the culture? Well, it changed too. What did it? I'm not sure exactly, but what I do know is that when sitting in a wet, freezing, muddy trench for months on end, well, that's horrible, especially when the only thing you have to look at is a red paste that used to be your comrades. It was not a good time. And it made a lot of folks go a little, you know, a little crazy. Number 10, mummy unwrapping parties. This is, uh, yeah, pretty disgusting right off the hop. During the Victorian era, there was a fascination with ancient Egypt and the practice of mummification because they didn't have Netflix back then, so people gathered to do this. Mummy unwrapping parties were a popular social event where wealthy individuals, they would purchase well, mummies, and then gather with their friends and family to unwrap them, just slowly unwrapping a person. That's disgusting. These events were often held in the privacy of their own homes or museums and were viewed as a form of entertainment and education. Both, no, definitely not for both. Guests would gather around the unwrapped mummy to inspect and marvel at the preserved body. However, these events were controversial as they were viewed as disrespectful and unethical by many and if not all people around them. As these mummies were often obtained through questionable means. Yeah, how does that guy end up in London? You know, a pharaoh is now in London? That makes no sense. For sure not where he died. Definitely not where he died. The trend eventually came to an end as archaeologists began to push for more, you know, respectful treatments of ancient artifacts and real people and their remains. What kind of purge party is this? What are we doing here? Can we go home? Number nine, your skin can breathe. This, yeah, I don't know. We're all frogs. Little did I know. During this era, there was a widespread belief among scientists, like real scientists, that human skin could breathe. Similar to how lungs inhale and exhale air. Yeah, we could breathe through our skin. That's, that's a fun one. This theory was based on the idea that the skin has pores that allowed oxygen to be absorbed and carbon dioxide to then be expelled. As a result, some people would wear looser clothing and avoid tight corsets to allow their skin to well, breathe more easily. Literally, to allow you to breathe more easily. That's so gross. However, this belief was eventually debunked as it became clear that the skin does not actually function like a set of lungs. Ha! Huh, who knew? Not me, that's for sure. Nonetheless, the idea of skin breathing persisted in popular culture and language for many years after. You know, there were some believers that are like, no, our hands are breathing. You can breathe through our hands. Number eight, crotchless undergarments. While it may sound shocking, crotchless underwear was indeed a part of Victorian era fashion. It was most common for women, however, it wasn't intended to be scandalous in any way, shape, or form. Rather, it was a practical solution to the difficulties of wearing heavy petticoats and, well, corsets while still needing to use the restroom. Gotta undo a lot of stuff. At first, you're like, eh, this doesn't sound very good. Yeah, it makes quite practical, I guess, if you all have to wear nine duvets as a dress. It's pretty practical. Though it may seem strange to modern sensibilities, crotchless underwear was a functional and necessary aspect of Victorian fashion, but it was also hiding a little secret. Number seven, hair. Hair everywhere. Yeah, legs, body, you couldn't see anything, so you didn't have to shave anything, right? That's it, problem solved. During the Victorian era, it was not common for women to shave their legs or their bodies at all. This hadn't been invented yet, I don't know. The concept of hair removal was considered inappropriate, actually, and it was considered to be associated with the lower class. Yeah, so keep it, keep it thick. Women's clothing at all time was designed to cover most and all of their bodies, which meant that their hair was usually not visible. Nice. Moreover, using razors or other hair removal methods was also considered too bold or even unhealthy back in this era. See these creams back in the Victorian era, they were quite unsanitary. It was one thing putting it on your face, but removing hair and tender other areas, that of course could lead to infections or other health problems. It wasn't until the 20th century that hair removal became more accepted and even popular especially with the rise of shorter hemlines and more revealing clothing. Yeah, we'll shave it up a little bit, sure, why not? Number six, 
Lice everywhere. Lots of hair, therefore lots of lice. They go hand in hand. Sadly. During the Victorian era, lice were a significant problem due to poor hygiene and living conditions. Lice infestations were common among both the rich and the poor, so there's no getting away from this one. Many people suffered from itching, rashes, and infections caused by these little nasty parasites. Families had to use various remedies such as vinegar and kerosene in any attempt just to try and kill these little suckers. Some people needed special combs to remove lice and their eggs, gonna throw up, from their hair. Now, despite efforts to control the eggs and the lice problem in their scalp, the problem persisted throughout the Victorian era. It was tough, right? It wasn't until the early 20th century with the, you know, improved hygiene practices and the development of insecticide that lice infestations became less common. Yeah, we, we missed that. We were almost buggy in our hair. Close. Number five. Bleach mask. Madame Rowley's toilet mask. Where do I begin with this one? It's kind of fun, kind of terrifying to look at. At first I thought this was a mask you had to wear to go to the bathroom, but no, that would have been a bit better, a bit cooler. Just a Jabberwocky mask for no reason. Compared to everything else on this list, I was like, sure, people would do that, why not? A toilet mask was a natural beautifier for bleaching and preserving the skin. Even removing complexion imperfections. Yeah, all that happening under one Jason Goldie mask. What a treat, what a miracle rather. You'd only have to wear it three times a week and then Voila, you were beautiful. Turns out, lead cosmetics pasted onto a mask and then onto your face three times a week. That was not beneficial for your health. Yeah, who knew, right? Ah, smelled so healthy. We didn't end up looking younger. We ended up poisoning our faces all in the name of beauty. But just wait, it gets worse. Number four. Toilet troubles. Ah, the bathroom, another dangerous reason why we can't use it. Victorian era was unsanitary to say the least, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole methane gas problem. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common. And now I have a new fear. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time in and around human waste. Human waste would build up over sewers and eventually would back up into your home in that era. So next thing you knew, you're lighting a candle and well, your bathroom and your entire life is gone, just like that. And you didn't even get to go to the bathroom. That's it, it's the worst part. Number three, hot, dry summers. In the summer of 1858, London was hit by a severe heat wave, causing the Thames River to dry up and then release a strong odor of sewage and rotting matter and feces. Anything that's in that water is now just sitting out and about. So you can only imagine. The stench was so unbearable that it made people sick. It disrupted businesses in the area. It was a real problem. The problem was caused by a lack of sewage treatment facilities and of course raw sewage being dumped directly into the river. Well, that sure didn't help, did it? The sting drew public attention to the need for better sanitation and prompted the government to invest in the construction of a modern sewage system. It had to get really stinky before we solved it. This event marked a turning point in the history of public health in London and led to significant improvements in sanitation practices that helped to prevent the spread of disease. So again, had to get really bad before it got better. I'm gonna say not great, but better. Number two, weird Christmas cards. Number two, weird Christmas cards. During the Victorian era, there wasn't much to give your loved one, right? You can't give them a Nintendo Switch Lite. You're like, hey, here's a picture of a frog doing a tango. That's all I got, that's it. The practice of exchanging Christmas cards became popular during this time. These cards would feature colorful illustrations of winter scenes, nativity scenes, other festive motives, you name it. Whatever they could tell stories of, they would draw it in really weird, wacky ways. The tradition began in 1843 when Sir Henry Cole commissioned an artist to create a card for him to send to his friends and his family. Now the cards were expensive but were initially only affordable for those wealthy folk. But as printing technology improved, they became more widely available. So score, now you get to tell your loved ones how you actually feel with a wacky guy playing a tambourine. Victorian Christmas cards often featured sentimental messages and elaborate designs and they became an important part of the holiday season where we get it from today. All that pressure to write a little something something comes from that era. Today Today, vintage Victorian Christmas cards are highly collectible and are appreciated for their beautiful artwork. Beautiful, I guess, art is subjective. And its historical significance is rather amazing. I don't know, if you have one of these, don't throw them out. Don't make fun of them, just frame it and then sell it for a million dollars in 10 years. There you go. And finally, number one, beauty patches. In the Victorian era, beauty patches were a popular trend among women of high society. There were these small black patches that were applied to the face as a way to accentuate certain features and draw attention to the wearer, the pale Victorian complexion. The patches were made of silk or velvet and were often cut into fun shapes like hearts, stars, or crescent moons, right? It's like the scene kids back then they're like mm. <laughs> they were typically worn on the cheek forehead or around the mouth you can get creative right it's your face 
have at her. Beauty patches were also believed to have medicinal purposes, with some claiming they could cure headaches or improve one's complexion. Both absolutely false. No medical science around that. Despite their popularity, beauty patches were eventually, sadly, phased out of fashion by the early 20th century. But let's bring them back. I don't know. What do you all say? I'll wear a beauty patch every list from now on if we all want it. Why not? I'll do one right over here, a little crescent moon. I'll be moody, right? Number 10, rope makers. My arms are tired just thinking of this one already. Here we go. The Victorian era saw physically demanding work, especially, of course, in rope making factories. Today they have machines spin and get everything done in six seconds. Back then, you had to do it by hand. Their job involved the process of twisting these fibers again by hand, typically hemp or other materials, into these ropes using large manual machines. Now these workers would feed the fibers into the spinning machines which required quite a tremendous amount of strength and stamina to operate these things in the first place. Then the repetitive motion of twisting the fibers into ropes. And this took hours. This took tolls on their bodies. And of course, this often led to strained or pulled muscles. It's like a tug of war, but that's your job forever. That's a nightmare. The job required precision and skill to ensure the ropes were properly formed and durable. Because, you know, the town's construction sites were relying on these ropes to work. Nobody wants a lousy rope. I'm going rock climbing this weekend, and I'm going to think of lousy rope when I'm at the top. Get all shaky. Number nine, asylum attendants. When the dancing plague happened, you know, back then, city officials didn't call in medical experts, but instead they called in a band to play music while these convulsing victims danced. So when we think of mental health and how it was treated back in Victorian times and history, it's eh, not so friendly, right? Not so comforting, that's for sure. Asylum assistants, okay, this was a job. They were responsible for managing individuals with mental illnesses, some of whom displayed violent or unpredictable behaviors. However, these attendants lacked proper support and training, which left them ill-equipped to handle such challenging circumstances. And in results, it was all Oh, it was all bad. The attendants faced physical and emotional dangers enduring aggressive outbursts, attacks, and the lack of training arguably made these distressing and unpredictable situations way worse. Asylum attendants were like, eh, stop, what are you doing? It's like, that doesn't help. That's not how we do things. These attendants also worked long hours in overcrowded and understaffed facilities, making their job mentally and physically draining. The conditions they faced highlight the significant shortcomings and neglect in mental health care during the Victorian era. Yeah, they called them like mental asylums. You're like, can we change this up? Why is it so scary? Number eight, matchstick dippers. Just sounds dangerous right off the hop. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't know why matchsticks are this big all of a sudden. Matchstick dippers. Just sounds dangerous right off the hop dipping a matchstick, what's gonna happen here? Matchstick dippers, these folks would often dip wooden sticks into a mixture of phosphorus and other chemicals to create matches. Someone's gotta do it, and back then they did it in a very dangerous way. Process of coating the sticks in the phosphorus mixture exposed workers to toxic fumes and harmful substances. Prolonged exposure to phosphorus led to a condition known as fossy jaw, which caused excruciating pain and disfigurement of the jawbone. Fossy jaw, they should make it sound less fun maybe, I don't know. Matchstick dippers predominantly young women suffered from serious health issues, including bone deterioration and necrosis. Furthermore, the work environment was loaded with fire hazards, of course, as phosphorus is highly flammable, science. The combination of toxic substances, long working hours, and the risk of factory fires every minute of every day made matchstick dipping a very, made matchstick dipping a very dangerous, life-threatening occupation during this time. Even now, I'm like, I don't wanna be anywhere near any phosphorus, thank you. Number seven, crossing sweepers. Back in the Victorian era, crossing sweepers were these individuals who earned a living by sweeping and clearing the streets for pedestrians to cross, right? Today we have the big scary thing with wheels, the big scary Decepticon looking truck that goes by and blows debris into your eyes, the spinning brushes. In the olden days, that was done by hand. Just one dude. Streets during this time were often dirty and filled with mud, horse, and other debris, just every, everything bad was on the streets. Crossing sweepers used brooms and brushes to create a clear path. Crossing sweepers used brooms and brushes to create a clear path, and in return, they would ask you for a small tip or payment from those who used their services. They're like, here, I cleared literal for you. How about a dollar? Thanks. They were especially common in urban areas where foot traffic was high, like downtown. Crossing sweepers were quite young. They were you know, really young, if I can say that, if you get where I'm going there. And they relied on filthy streets as a mean to survive. So what a horrible, what a horrible scenario. Number six, 
Human alarm clocks. Halfway through, we'll get a little fun, then we'll get back to the weird stuff. Human alarm clocks, also known as knocker-ups or knocker-uppers, which sounds a little different nowadays, so we'll go with human alarm clock. One of the weirdest jobs ever. I kind of wish this was still a thing. I don't know, I'd apply in a heartbeat. Knockers, knocker-ups, these guys, they single-handedly provided a unique wake-up service during the Victorian era for phones and clocks and all that helpful stuff. Before the widespread availability of alarm clocks, especially among the working class, everybody who had places to be, well, a knocker up has your back. He'd come and smack your window six times and then run off into the woods. What a great job. I kind of want this job. They would use long sticks or poles, whatever, just to tap your bedroom windows. Tap your windows and scare you awake. That often works. Shoot out of bed every morning. That's great. Think someone's breaking into your house. These individuals were typically paid a small fee for their services, which is wild considering what they're doing. Knocker ups played a crucial role in the industrial areas with the rise of affordable alarm clocks. The need for these guys sadly disappeared. But you know what? Let's bring it back. Let's get rid of alarm clocks. They're all scary. Get these guys to come and tap on your window. Hey, you have work. Get up. They're like, thanks, sir. Please get out. Number five. Hand stitchers. Yeah, this one's not as stinky, sure, when you think of these jobs, but it still sucked. With the rise of industrialization, many garments and household items were still hand sewn. Hand stitchers, again, often young women, they would sew clothing, linens, and other products using needles and thread. They worked in tight factories, overcrowded workshops, or sometimes in their own homes, often under poor conditions and for low wages, really low wages. The demand for hand stitched goods remained high as mass production techniques weren't widespread yet. It was close, but once sewing machines came into the picture, yeah, it eventually led to the decline of hand stitchers, which is good, right? I don't know, I'm torn because part of me is like, awesome, they don't have to do that by hand anymore. Then I'm like, ah, their only job was replaced by machines. So I'm like, eh, I don't know. I really don't have this one. Number four, bone grubbers. Again, sounds like it's gonna suck just from the name. A bone grubber? What does that do? Bone grubbers were these individuals who scavenged animal bones for various purposes. They liked all the bones. That's all I'll say. They loved any and all bones. You can figure it out. They collected bones from landfills, battlefields, and even graveyards. These bones were used for making fertilizer, bone meal, bone utensils. Fancy, I'm gonna grab my bone fork. Cheers. And even crafting tools. Bone grubbers worked in poor conditions and faced controversy for their activities because, you know, they would uh, steal bones from fresh graves, so more than fair, I'd say. As regulations on waste management in graveyards tightened, the practice of bone grubbing declined and hopefully disappeared forever because, uh, yeah, stop. Yeah, thanks. Stop stealing my aunt's femur. Get out of here. Number three, chimney sweeps. These ones were horrible. Uh, this one really sucked. I'll say what I can here without breaking YouTube guidelines, but yeah, these lads here, these chimney sweeps, they were younger gentlemen. As homes and factories heavily relied on coal for heating and manufacturing, chimneys became clogged with debris more and more every day. It's looking yucky up there. Now, instead of an old man who's broken, they would send in these, again, young lads, quite young lads, all I'll say. The shorter the better, right? Get them up there. Chimney sweeps would climb up narrow and dark chimneys using brushes and scrapers to remove all this horrible buildup. It was really not a fun time. Yeah, that's really all I can say about it. The work was dangerous. It exposed them to toxic fumes and the risk of getting stuck or falling, well, that surely didn't help. Eventually, thanks to public outcry and legislation, this job disappeared in the late 19th century. Although I remember cleaning my chimney when I was younger. Hmm, I'm gonna call my dad after this list. Number two, a tosher. Being afraid of rats and the dark, well, this is quite impressive to look back on. A tosher was a person who ventured into the dark and filthy underground sewer system in search of valuable items. Anything, really. I mean, we're down here. Anything good. Anything that's not soft, we'll take it. Toshers would navigate the labyrinth tunnels armed with a long pole with a hook in hopes to retrieve anything of worth. Coins, discarded jewelry, again, pretty much any other valuable objects that may have been accidentally dropped or washed away. Now they have it. Now they often faced harsh, well, rather disgusting disgusting conditions. Like, uh, for example, tons of human that's definitely down there for sure. Toxic gases, disease-ridden water, tons of rats, more human sh And given the era, there was a risk of collapsing tunnels all around you. So really the worst job you can think of in the Victorian era. Toshers relied on this hazardous occupation as a means of survival. It was all they got. Whatever you lost was all they had to live off. So what a terrible era, horrible job. And finally, number one, during the Victorian era, grave robbers emerged. Just all of them out of nowhere. They're like, yeah, yes, with their shovels. Due to the high demand in medical research, okay? You give someone a body, they give you some money. That's all they had back then. No paperwork, in and out, boom. 
With a limited legal supply, these individuals resorted to stealing freshly buried corpses, targeting the graves of the poor and marginalized. Yeah, history is so scary, so disgusting. Armed with shovels, again, just coming out of the bushes with their shovels in hand, with their uh, weird, I don't know, who does this? They operated at night, of course, employing various techniques to avoid detection. Obviously they did this like they were Batman, they didn't want to get caught because that's a little illegal. The stolen bodies were then sold to medical schools and private lectures. Public outrage led to the Autonomy Act of 1832. Thank God this was passed. This is a really fun one here. This legalized the donation of unclaimed bodies to medical institutions and reduced the need for grave robbery and established a regulated source of supplies. Instead of dudes just finding random people buried in random places and then bringing them in. That's, I'm glad we got rid of that. That's good. I thought dissecting a frog in science, I thought that was weird, but where those frogs come from, you know what I mean? But kicking off the list at number 10, dark dining. I don't know about you, but I can't eat in the dark. I need to see every single bite that I'm eating, okay? Call me crazy. Part of me wants to go to a restaurant where you can't see anything, but I know that I won't make it all the way through. I can't do it. I like, I have a thing. I have to just, I'm not blindly what if it's not cooked? I don't know. Back in the Victorian era, dining in complete darkness wasn't just a date night. It was actually the best way to digest, or so they thought. That's why many Victorian era homes had their dining rooms set up in their basement. How random is that? Oh, do you guys have poker nights down here? Nah, just brunch. Kill the light. <laughs> what? How do you like your eggs? Turn off the light. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Number nine, saved by the bell. I'm sure you've heard about this at some point, but allow me to go into grim detail. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, everything bad, you name it, it was all spreading. Not an ideal time to be alive. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course being gravely ill, but with this came a dark trend. The safety coffin. Yeah, we got a safety, we got the safety dance, now we got the safety coffin, here we go. These coffins, I mean, God forbid you were buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again and exit said coffin. A lot of these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground and attached to a bell on the outside. So if a passerby or heard it, one, that would be so scary, but if they heard it, they would know something's up and they would help them out. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. For example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester, he passed in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his casket, revealing a layer of glass. Now, if anybody were to see condensation, he could then be removed. Patent number 81,437 was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868. It was an approved burial case, a real patent. This was a real coffin. This is crazy. This one had an air inlet, a ladder, and a bell. All three, there you go. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, he could ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save himself from premature death by being buried alive. Nice. You thought you died. Psych, climb this ladder. There you go. Good luck getting out. Now you're in an escape room. Enjoy. You only get two hints. Play a little walkie talkie. Hey, uh, how do I get out of the coffin in room B? Number eight, no air. Now that song's gonna be stuck in your head. Jordan Sparks, a classic. Since we're on the topic of safety coffins, I had to include one more. Maybe two more, I'll never tell. This one is fascinating. The science involved here was honestly impressive. There was the classic wire and bell method, but the more sick people got, the more creative they had to become. Like for example, patent number 268,693, John Krishbaum's device for indicating life in buried persons. Yeah, an 1882 classic, we love this. We got the iPod Nano, they got the device O life. Nice. Upon first glance, you may think this is some type of medieval punishment, whatever, but really this device detects movement whilst providing much needed air. Now you obviously can't have a hole in the ground or else rats will make your real demise much worse than suffocating, right? So John's device here, as per the disclosure details, is that if the person buried should come to life, a motion of his hands will turn the branches of the T-shaped pipe upon or near which his hands are placed. A marked scale on the side of the top indicates movement of the T and air will then pass Passively come down the pipe. Once sufficient time has passed to assure the person is dead, the device can be removed. Yeah, imagine waking up with this in your hands. I wouldn't be calm enough to turn it and then breathe in a passive amount of air. No way, there's nothing passive about waking up in a coffin. Number seven, bad hair day. Okay, you want it messed up? Let's do messed up. Hope you're not eating any food right now, especially not eating in the dark. 
two red flags. Okay, the Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 had readers invested on this fateful day. Right on the cover, it read, a 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. Now at the time, that's not far off from average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case, was odd. Everyone wanted to read about this. This case was noteworthy. It was important that folks understood what took this young lady's life. Doctors asked the family if they can carry out a post-mortem, and lo and behold, they found a two pound, solid chunk of hair sitting in her stomach. Two pounds. That's what happened. That's how she met her fate. That's horrible. This ball of hair caused an ulceration of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. The woman's sister did note that over the last dozen years or so, she had casually been eating her own hair. So at this time, I say, if you know anybody eating hair, send them this link. It's not a good idea. Cut that out. Stop doing that. Number six, the Great Famine. Weird time to talk about a famine after the hair incident, but okay, here we go. Back in 1845, a potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on was no longer available. This was huge. This is bad history right here. A group of microorganisms wiped them all out, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law at this point and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people. This famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. Historical, definitely. Messed up, absolutely. Number five, Queen Victoria's name change. Every year on May 2-4, we set off fireworks, then we have way too many hot dogs. It's the best. We call it Victoria Day, right? It's for sure called Victoria Day, right? Well, back in 1819, Victoria was christened in an almost private ceremony. It was small, obviously. Victoria's uncle only let a few people attend. Like I mentioned in part one, she had an isolated childhood with the whole Kensington system. That was no way to live. But even the day she was christened, trouble awaited. Her name was Alexandrina Victoria, and at the time, the name Victoria was not regal. It was a French origin, almost an odd name to have at the time, so she was immediately advised to change her name to something more traditional. But as our calendars can definitely confirm, she said, nope, I'm good. Victoria Day. Yeah, it's definitely Victoria Day. Number four, tattoos. I only have the one tattoo, but I've always wanted more. It's not so good with needles, you know? I got my eyebrow pierced and I fainted. It's a fun fact, I have a little scar there. Not great with needles. Some of the designs are so beautiful on tattoos, the amount of pain you all sit through, I'm impressed, honestly, mad respect. The tattoo craze really took off once Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, he went and visited Jerusalem. And of course he saw copious amounts of body art and was inspired. Inspired, we'll say, yeah. So upon his return, he was all about ink at this point. And the Prince of Wales, well if he has a sleeve, well then maybe I can have a sleeve, right? What's going on? It wasn't a sleeve, really. It was a cross. The prince got a tattoo of a cross in homage to the Crusades. So if you're gonna try and convince your parents to let you get a tattoo, just, you know, tell them the Prince of Wales did, right? You're just trying to be a royal. Number three, gym day. Believe it or not, they were around 200 gyms across Europe during Victorian times. Yeah, just like six good lives. So you're like, what? what's this about? Even Victorian dudes skip leg day. How great is that, okay? It's not just you. These gyms weren't bright, they weren't open, they weren't well ventilated, they weren't motivating, and definitely not safe. None of those, definitely not. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class, obviously. Grab your pocket watch and blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing squats today. These machines also were not ideal. They were designed as antiques first rather than their purpose. Also, half of these look like saw traps. Like, are you kidding me? No way I'd bend my arm around any of these devices. No way. All those wooden wheels? No. I'll stay weak and brittle. Thank you. Number two, ghost photography. Had to look back. I don't like talking about ghosts. As if the reanimated corpses coming back to life while they were ringing a bell wasn't scary enough. Yeah, let's talk about 1800s ghost photography. The camera was a hot new invention at this time, so tales of ghosts and spirits were now easily believed. Yeah, obviously, when you have a photo of a see-through woman, you're like, I, that must be, that's pretty terrifying. A big name in the ghost game was a man named William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849, and Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister, and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. So far, so good. This British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a real spirit. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine a day where somebody being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize also poses for photo ops with ghosts. You're like, I don't, do we believe all of this or none of this? What's going on? This is so scary. And finally, number one, music for eternity. 
Before we wrap up this wild part two, I had to include perhaps one of the creepiest patents of all time. Patent numero 9,222,059. Yeah, the number is going a little bit higher. This one got me thinking. I wanted to end this video off on this note. I like this idea. Maybe, I don't know yet. Music for Eternity Systems. Okay, this patent is not from the 1800s, but rather 2015. I know, it's not Victorian, but when else am I gonna talk about this, really? The idea here is that you could stay connected to your loved one by using a solar-powered digital music player. The best part here is the patent details how surviving family members now have the ability to update, revise, and edit stored audio files and programming after burial. Yeah, next Rihanna album, no problem, I got you. There's a speaker in the casket and there's a headphone jack on the tombstone so we can listen together and then we can decide if we hate the album. That's creepy. I wouldn't do this. Would you want this? Sound off below if you'd want, you know, big shiny tunes playing for eternity after you die. I would do the Titanic theme song. Just make everyone so sad all the time. Kick it off the list at number 10, Smokey Behind. When somebody tells you that you're just blowing smoke, it means that you're lying, okay? You've now been given exaggerated information of sorts. Well, back in the 18th century, they literally had to blow tobacco smoke at your behind. Yeah, weirdest work break ever, I'd say. So why did we perform magician enemas back in the day? What was the deal here? Well, tobacco smoke enemas were used to treat quite a few symptoms, or they thought so, including a common cold. These enemas came in these fancy kits with a fancy rubber tube. It was all fancy because it was an honest medical practice at the time. It was done by legit medical practitioners. This is the funniest part. The idea was that the tobacco smoke could warm up a soon to be deceased body. The nicotine would stimulate your adrenal glands, jolting you back into good health. The best health, might we say. And the way they would do it in the mid 1800s was by just blowing smoke and just waiting, seeing what happened. We're figuratively and literally blowing smoke. That's the origin of that saying, fun fact there. Imagine doing that today. Like, hey, I think I dislocated my shoulder. What do I do? He's like, hey, one sec. Number nine, alarm clocks. While the medical world was one threat in Victorian times, apparently so was the technological side. Who knew? We obviously didn't have reliable alarm clocks back in the 1800s, obviously, but we did have jobs. So in order to get up on time, lamp lighters or knockers would come by and tip you off. Yeah, they would just yell in your window and just alarm. That's how you'd wake up. A man would yell into your window and smack you with a stick. Legend has it, a young man named Sam Wardell, he got a little creative with his wake up calls. He needed more than a lamp lighter at 5 a.m. So he would Tony Stark this alarm clock gadget. He would use wires, a bunch of stones, all that unsafe stuff. Then at a certain time, stones would fall to the ground, of course, waking him up and presumably everyone else in the building. That would be alarming. Well, Christmas Eve, 1885, tragedy unfolded. A few friends had come over for a holiday visit. So Sam had to move some furniture around, rightfully so, to make room for, you know, windmills and break dancing, whatever they did in Victorian Christmas times. The next morning, he forgot to put things back in the small apartment and the obvious happened. The rocks then fell on him while he was asleep. Yeah, that probably doesn't feel too good. I thought iPhone alarms were jarring. I take back everything I've ever said. Number eight, relaxative. Okay, so right off the bat, the Victorian era was a little messy. I'm sure you've gathered this by now here on Bumblebee. But these messy new illnesses were putting lots of pressure on medical practitioners, so they were desperate for these new treatments. We laugh at Victorian medical treatments, but they tried, okay? They at least tried. They also achieved many medical breakthroughs as well. But when it comes to handling chicken pox in the Victorian era, well, that wasn't one of them. That was not our finest hour. Chicken pox in the Victorian era was being treated by using laxatives. Yeah, let that sink in for a moment. I have chicken pox, what should I do? Well, try some laxatives. Yeah, folks would slam some castor oil and then, ready for this? They would get even more sick. Who would have thought? You thought you were uncomfortable before, castor oil, yeah, chug that, and then now you're even weaker, now you're dead. Number seven, backed up. Let's say it's the Victorian era and let's say you're constipated, right? It happens, you know? Well, bad ideas will most likely follow, if you didn't already guess that. According to Merck's 1899 medical manual, small amounts of strychnine were prescribed to those who were constipated. Yeah, the strychnose nux vomica was thought to better the gastric functions. Even a small amount of this stuff would attack your respiratory system. You'd contract, you convulse, it's horrible. It'd be a painful way to go out. It's much, much worse than being constipated. Any day, I would much rather be constipated than any type of strychnine, are you kidding me? Number six, leeches. I grew up with hearing problems. I've been around the block with earaches, ear infections. I had ear tubes numerous times, all that jazz. So I feel really bad for the folks in this next one, okay? I hear you, pun intended. 
In the Victorian era, medical practitioners would say to use leeches for your ear infections. That's the number one trick. They don't want you to know. There it is. Once they're attached to you, the idea was that they can numb pain while at the same time providing proteins and peptides to its host. So on paper, again, the idea made sense. But the science didn't quite follow, did it? It wasn't entirely hopeless though. Recently in 2004, the FDA reintroduced leeches to the medical world, yeah, because their bite can break up blood clots and induce blood flow. So it's not entirely hopeless. We talked about leech collectors on this channel before, so of course we have to talk about more of the science that they were hoping to achieve with it, right? Also, I worked at a retirement home when I was 16. I thought that job sucked. Imagine being a leech collector? No way. Number five, cat attacks. If I had to pick, I would of course say I'm 100% a dog person. I got, I'm sorry, I grew up with two cats, I'm allergic. I grew up with two dogs, not allergic. Dog guy all the way, sorry. Cats are cool, but this next story just totally freaked me out. Back in 1870, this rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. How lovely is that? She had tons of cats, she loved all of them, and they loved her. Again, I'm allergic, so this, I'm already sneezing just reading about this story. It was the 1800s, okay? A lot of candles, everything was obviously extremely flammable, and disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out at this young woman's home. The cats were trapped inside the house. Now, they made it outside, don't freak out or anything, they all made it out. But by the time the two maids had kicked the door open to rescue said cats, they had gone full primal. They were afraid, they were freaking out. They were just scratching their way out through anyone and everything. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both sadly attacked by all of these cats. What a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives. I pulled my cat's tail when I was younger. I learned real quick uh, never to do that ever again. Number four, hiccups. Today we have many cures for hiccups, yeah. You gotta get scared or hold your breath or drink water like while you're doing a handstand. I don't know, everyone's got weird ideas, whatever. But nothing was as dangerous as the Victorian era hiccup cure, yeah. Ready for this one, don't try it. This one's scarier than a jump scare, that's for sure. In 1899, again, in the good old Merck Medical Manual, it recommended using chloroform to cure your hiccups. Uh? Yeah, just completely damage your entire nervous system and poison your kidneys, for sure. To get rid of hiccups, that's way better. This 19th century anesthetic was not a solution. Never try this. Continue scaring your family and friends. That's definitely the way we handle hiccups now. Number three, tapeworms. Back in the Victorian times, they really figured out the trick to weight loss. Yeah, was it watching what you eat, maybe counting your steps, maybe getting a gym membership, something like that? Nope, nope, and no way. No, it was way easier than all those things combined. Can you believe that? And you didn't even have to pull back on how much you were consuming. Doesn't this sound fascinating? What is this? Well, all you needed was a handy tapeworm. Yep, I don't have one. I don't know why I pointed. That'd be gross if I had one. Yeah, tapeworm. You know those things that can kill you today if you get one? See, the plan was if you eat a tapeworm egg, okay, it will later hatch in your stomach and at that point you could just eat anything you wanted because every time you ate, the tapeworm would also eat. So you could get your snack on while still rocking those Victorian skinny jeans, right? Tapeworm cis pills or go for a jog. Your call. Number two, Victoria's reign. Queen Victoria's reign started in 1837 and it lasted until the queen's death later on in 1901. At just age 18, Alexandrina Victoria had to rise up to the throne. She was born, of course, on May 24th, 1819. Queen Victoria was fifth in line when she was born, so right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely that she would ever get the crown. Then one by one, out of nowhere, all of her family members began passing away suddenly. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed away and then her father and grand father both died a week apart from each other. So by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old and already she was next in line for the throne. That's how fast it happens. So as if that wasn't already stressful enough, Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of before, it's, it's pretty awful. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from mates or family members, anything fun or social, you name it. Her mother did this to keep her Pure, of course, to keep her the most pure lady. This system sounds awful. Her mother would monitor her every action, including who she can see or speak to. Victoria only had two playmates growing up. That's it. I'm like, hey, me too. She had her half-sister, Princess Fedora of Lennington, and the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoire. I mean, only three friends growing up, that's cruel. She shared a room with her mother until she was finally queen. Yeah, she couldn't walk down the hallway alone at any point. She had to always walk with her mother by her side, even to the washroom, that's crazy. Victoria has reflected on her childhood since, and yeah, she hates John Conroy for manipulating her mother, and she actually refers to him as demon incarnate, so 
That's good, it's a nice nickname. Incarnate, Incarnate. He's a demon, he's the worst. Let's just call him that. And finally, number one, Royal Enemies. Being the queen and all, a security team is of course needed at all times. And during her reign, there were multiple attempts to harm the young Queen Victoria. The first attack was back in 1840. It was a young guy named Edward Oxford and he attacked the queen's carriage. Just ran at it like a crazy guy. Obviously, then thankfully, nothing happened. But when Edward was later accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again, but this time it was two men attacking the carriage. And then in 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit the carriage with his cane. He was going nuts as well. Everyone wants this carriage. This is like the ultimate, no one's getting through this carriage, apparently. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook after all these events. Then again in 1842, 1849, 1872, attempt after attempt, it was horrifying. But then things got a little worse with a man named Boyd Jones. Yeah, this guy stalked the queen from 1838 until 1841. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. He knew a way in just to Buckingham Palace, which should never be a thing in the first place. And the weird part is here, Boyd Jones, once he was inside the palace, he would hide under the queen's sofa. And he would also just sit on her throne for hours, just hanging out. Yeah, he would pretend he's Cersei Lannister and just sit on the throne for a minute or two. Think about life. Eventually, thankfully, he got caught, but Imagine coming home and Boyd Jones is sitting on your couch. You're like, what are you doing? Take that shirt off, get out of here. Kicking off the list at number 10, a lot of hair. To kick off this wild part two, I had to include the tale of the woman who ate her own hair. Why did she do it? What happened? How much hair? Well, let's find out. All the questions about to be answered. The Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 got the attention of those passerbyers with this one. A 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. That's not too far off from the average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case, this case was a little odd. Something was off about it. So doctors asked the family if they could carry out a postmortem. And lo and behold, a two pound solid chunk of hair was sitting in her stomach. It caused ulcerations of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. What a horrible way to go out. The woman's sister didn't know that over the last dozen years or so, she had been casually eating her own hair. Just one piece every now and then. Ultimately, it added up. If you know anybody that's eating their own hair, pass this on, send them this video. This sounds rather uncomfortable. Number nine, cat attack. If I have to pick, I would say I'm 100% a dog guy. Cats are cool, don't get me wrong, but this next story freaks me out a bit. Also, I had a cat once and I pulled its tail on it. <laughs> pissed at me and scratched me and scared the life out of me. So, dog, dogs for sure. Back in 1870, a rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. What a fun little hobby and lifestyle. She had tons of cats, she loved them all equally, and they loved her. I'm allergic also, so this story is my nightmare on a level. But it does sound like a cute time, I'll admit, that's a nice way. Especially like in the Victorian era, what a, what a lovely little pocket of fun. 1800s, a lot of candles, everything being extremely flammable, disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out of this young woman's home, and the cats were sadly trapped in the house. They made it out alive, but by the time they made it out, the two maids that had kicked the door open to rescue them, they had gone full primal. The cats just attacked them and it was all bad. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both attacked by them at full force, essentially, all of these cats. It's like, what a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives, you know what I mean? Number eight, quick divorce. Let's just say the love thing isn't working out, okay? It happens, people change, but now what? Say it's the Victorian era, but divorce in England isn't allowed until 1857. And it's 1856. So now what are we gonna do? Well, considering what list we're on and which part it is, it's pretty wildly unfair. If you were the wife, you were getting sold in this scenario. How horrible is that? Wife sellers, they were a thing. That was a legitimate business, how horrible. Yeah, you were getting sold if you were the wife. How horrible is that? Wife sellers was a legitimate business. There were auctions, public auctions would be done. You would watch people bid on marrying your wife. At like noon, middle of the day, people are walking by like, oh, do I have any change? Hang on. This is insane. One real sale that happened in 1862 was in Selby. The asking price was a beer. The asking price for this person's wife was one pint. Sold, just like that, that's crazy. Sold, drank, now I'm married. That's insane. Other times, most of the time, it was a rather expensive exchange. I feel like there are plenty of cases where this would honestly be the ideal scenario. Just get it done in one day, whatever, peace. See you again, bye, you're the worst. Number seven, the Great Famine. 
We're gonna lean out a wife selling for a hot minute and include the boys for this one. Yeah, come on back in, you're all guilty. The Great Famine took out everybody, not just Victorian women, of course. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population was relying on was no longer available all of a sudden. A group of microorganisms just wiped them out, just like that, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people that really needed it. So this famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. A little fun bit of history I had to include on this one. Number six, the Brooklyn Theater Stampede. And we're back to absolute horribleness. Here we go. I love the theater. When the pandemic shut down plays, I actually felt pretty sad. I like sitting in full rooms watching a guy in a fake wig monologue about Mozart. Like that's my ideal Saturday night. That's the best. I don't want that to not be a thing anymore. I love theater. But today we have an obnoxious amount of distractions that can take you out of the experience. Guy's texting, fighting his ex-girlfriend two rows ahead of me. I'm trying to watch Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I'm like, man, it's not the same anymore. Theater's not the same anymore. Turn off your phone, throw a tomato at him. It can be distracting. Exit signs can also be pretty distracting, but we need them. We definitely need them. Because in 1876, the Brooklyn Theater caught fire after a single lantern fell over on stage during a performance. This was 1876. Everybody was wearing flammable attire. There aren't emergency exits yet. A fire marshal hadn't come in and counted heads at this point, so it was a disaster. 278 people lost their lives. A monument was put up after the incident. It shook the town, it was absolutely horrible. I read about this and I was like, that's horrible. We got included in, this is a horrible list. Number five, the hobble skirt. Yeah, so when people can't get out of burning theaters, it's stuff like this to blame. Just from this 1910 headline alone, I'm glad we don't have hobble skirts anymore. The June 12th, 1910 headline reads, the hobble skirt is the latest freak in women's fashions. The latest freak. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Nice. I'll take two, debit. Doesn't that sound like a bad time? Why would anyone want this? Sounds like you're gonna be late for everything. French designer Paul Poirier made these to free the bust, to free the, you know, have a lot of room in here, whilst shackling the legs. So you in turn have to, you can't move. Just where you need to move around uneven stone roads, I guess. Love the practicality on this one, Paul, thanks. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and acts, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Shoot, oh man, must be nice. I'll just be over here wearing jeans like an idiot. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons so they could, you know, actually walk around. Yeah, what fools. Oh, sorry, you want a button? <laughs> I don't speak broke, sweetie. Number four, lead-based. When I started here at the studio a year and a half ago, maybe two years, I was like, okay, I gotta put on face cream maybe. A lot, of, a lot of lights, a lot of HD this. Time to get rid of these bags under my eyes finally. I don't know, maybe drink some water. See what happens. Finding a skincare routine of any sorts is easy now, dare I say. The lovely World Wide Web has our back. You can learn how to draw your eyebrows on while listening to true crime. It's wonderful where we are today. But the cosmetic game, whew, back in the 18th century, not great. Turns out it wasn't that great, not that safe. RuPaul's Drag Race would have been a lethal sport, know what I mean? Back in the 18th century, lead mixed with vinegar was often used to make your face look, you know, more pale. The Victorian look, I guess, gotta have those veins pop out. A splash of sulfur for those freckles, horrible idea. Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and or arsenic, the same poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte, so not safe at all in any time, period. In fact, arsenic was on the priority list of hazardous substances, and toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing in this era, let alone Victorian. Number three, the Kensington system. Ah, oh, this was horrible. Queen Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard it before is awful. I was grounded more often than not growing up. I'll admit, you know, I was the youngest of three, so I tried some shady stuff every now and then, but this, this is another level. At least I could go to the washroom without supervision. You know what I mean? Yeah, buckle up. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from friends, family members, anybody, everybody, you name it. Her mother would monitor her every action on top of this, including who she can see or speak to, if there were any of those people at some point. Victoria only had two playmates growing up her entire life. She had her half-sister, Princess Fiodora of Lenigan, and then the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoria. I mean, I had like four friends growing up, 
you know, maybe five, five and a half, but this is just cruel. This is just unfair. Especially with a royalty too, you'd think you can have more things. No, less. She shared a room with her mother until she was a queen. That entire time, she literally couldn't walk down the hallway alone. Victoria has reflected on her childhood, and yeah, in case you're wondering, she hates John Conrad. She referred to him as a demon incarnate, so she's got the words. Number two, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, literally. You've heard of arsenic and old lace at some point, but what exactly are we talking about? Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, real name, his wife, Fanny, also real name, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that of course she sadly didn't survive. But this was sadly common in Victorian days. Puffy dresses, open candles as we heard earlier. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is, but some of them were made with literal poison. Some of them had arsenic made to have that like green look, like the real arsenic green look. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and her fingernails had turned green and green foam started coming out of her mouth and it was just a horrible way to go out. Arsenic's not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Although yeah, it did look nice for a hot minute. Not worth it. And finally, number one, Queen Victoria's threats. Being the queen and all, and we're talking about the Victorian era, I figured we'd end with this one. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed, and during her reign, there were multiple, multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. It was an 18-year-old man named Edward Oxford, and he fired towards the queen's carriage, but obviously and luckily missed. But when Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. They were found guilty. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, thankfully, but of course, she was shook. Then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here, I saved it for last because it's extremely unsettling. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841, Edward Jones, AKA Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. It was some Assassin's Creed type stuff. He just knew some back way, he climbed some window or whatever. The guy just knew a route in, so he would break in and would more often than not just hide under the queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne sometimes and one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers and like go through her clothes and stuff, it was creepy. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully he got caught. Of all the things you can do, of all the crimes you want to commit in the Victorian era, you're gonna go hide under a couch for five years? Okay, I'm glad he got caught, but just so weird. What a weird ending. Number 10, bottomless undies. I think I speak for everyone when I say that putting on a clean, fresh pair of underwear is a nice feeling. Gone is the brown underwear that was once white of yesterday, replaced with fresh loving linen of today. Now, if you're also like me, then you probably have some underwear with holes in it. I'll throw them out eventually, I'll, I'll get around to it, just I'll wear them a few more times first and then I'll get rid of them. But did you know that some ladies underwear in the Victorian era had no bottoms? Yeah. Part of the many layers of clothing that women were wearing back then, their underwear had no bottoms, which to me is the whole point of wearing bloomers in the first place. You gotta keep your business warm and packed away. I just don't understand what the point of having it all hang out is. That's just, that's just stupid. I don't know. Number nine, no razors. There's a joke about the 70s, George W. Bush and garden hedges here, but I'm gonna let you fill in the blanks. Basically, this is a time in history where you cannot hop in the whip and drive on over to your local hair razor dealership because there ain't no whips and there ain't no CVS. We're Shoppers Drug Mart if you're Canadian. Today, you can buy disposable razors pretty much anywhere and there's multiple models for doing so. When things get hairy, you got options. Women in the Victorian era were not so lucky. They had to go for the natural look. Now, not that there's anything wrong with that, it's just, I feel like a girl's gonna have her options. She's gonna be able to, you know, do her own thing. Why not? Number eight. The Dirty Thames. When you think of Victorian England and the people, there's only really two classes, the wealthy and the ones who are broke and sound like they're from Peaky Blinders, love. Yeah, that's right. However, even for women of high esteem with their bottomless undies and lady mains growing a flush, the streets of Victorian London weren't very bourgeois, to say the least. Muddy dirt roads, thieves, beggars, and a really bad smell. It just didn't smell very nice. 
Oh, and also a really scary guy, but we'll get to that in part one. But perhaps the most disgusting was the Thames River, which after years of treating it the same way Brendan Fraser was treated after the Mummy franchise was over, it wasn't a good look. It was full of filth, sewage, garbage, and animal cadavers. So much so that it was said you could walk across the river on top of them. That is no place for a lady to be. Oof. Number seven, calf ear appetizers. This one goes out to all the folks who like their steak well done, as this may be too much to stomach. Given the way food was prepped and handled back then, I would agree with most folks that cooking the devil out of your meat was probably just the safer bet. Sucks for me because I like my steak rare, as rare as you can make it. Blue, almost, honestly. I, I love it like that. I am also willing to bet that most of you folks who like your steak well done aren't a big fan of fat and gristle. <laughs> I also love fat and grizzle. I just like meat, what can I say? What I'm getting to is calf ear appetizers. Yes, cooked calf ears, which I'm pretty sure are just like pure cartilage. Higher class women could often find themselves at parties where they would serve up this chewy delight. You'd probably just be chewing on that for a while. I feel like most people wouldn't like that. Is Chris a cartilage guy? I don't know, we'll see. Number six, hand cleavage. This goes for every inch of the skin, really, but women had to cover up back then. That means no ankles, neck, or God forbid a wrist. If a man saw a wrist, they would act up. Uh, ooh. Well, I don't know if they were that down bad, but women of higher esteem wore gloves. There's, there's etiquette to gloves. It was all part of the, the culture, which means only women with dosh could practice such glove etiquette. I say no woman should have the cover up. She should wear whatever the heck she wants when the heck she wants to. However, with the gloves, I believe there's a separate issue. I have an issue being a big dude with asthma. I sweat a lot more than the average folk. It just sucks, but if I was a fair lady with those gloves on, well, I might want to leave them on. Wouldn't want to ruin anyone's appetites for calf ear appetizers because the smell and the sweat, it just, ooh, be gross, ooh. Number five, dress is too big. This is something I'm glad isn't a thing anymore. I, I'm not a person who likes to dress up. I'm a simple dude. Casual and comfortable is my forte. However, uncomfortable wearing suits is. I like to think I clean up well. And I understand sometimes you gotta wear drip. It's just how life goes. Sometimes you gotta dress up. I just don't think people should be showing up to any formal events in cowboy boots and a pop collar shirt. I've known a few of those people. But what I'm really talking about here is the obtuse size of women's dresses and just the whole culture of women's fashion back then. It's just crazy. Large and overbearing dresses with enough material to use as blankets when you sleep. I know that couldn't have been fun. It just, it's horrible. Especially with my sweat problem. A few hours in a suit and maybe a few beers later and the first thing I'm trying to do is take the suit off. It gets tight and sweaty in there and it's just a lot of material. It's just, it's just too much. Too much. And doorways, trying to get through doorways. Ugh. Forget about it. Number four, fava beans. Well, after all that sweating and being around all that foulness, ladies needed to detox. How about a nice face mask made of beef? Yes, that's right. To keep their skin young and beautiful, they would drape a slice of beef over their face. Nothing like a little Hannibal Lecter before bedtime. Now, I hear you saying, well, Chad, that's not that bad. Okay, but think about this though. For the time period, that beef was probably yucky due to food processing practices of the time, and, and there's just no fridges. That means it would stinky. I hope it was at least winter before these ladies decided to beef up like that. This process of beef was supposed to rejuvenate the skin because beef contains some important vitamins for such. I just, I can't recommend that. You just walk in with the beef and, hello darling, yes. Ugh, gross. Number three, hot Christmas. This is just so dumb. I'm just gonna go ahead and tell everyone at home right now not to do this, because I know some of you, and some of you are gonna be like, oh, thanks, Chetty, that's cool. No, don't do it. I'm a doctor, a lawyer, and a firefighter. Basically, this was a super fun game that felt like something out of Johnny Knoxville's head, not Victorian families gathering at Christmas. Basically, they would gather at Christmas to play a game called Snapdragon. You get a bowl of raisins and almonds, you pour some brandy in there, and maybe one out for your homie, and ignite the brandy. Once the bowl is on fire, the family will compete to see who can grab the flaming treats and eat them the fastest. Okay, second degree burns are not how I want to spend my holiday season, and also, in a time before smoke alarms and a modern fire service, this sounds like a really bad time. Grandpa could lose it out of his hands. Drapes catch fire, the house burns down, probably the whole neighborhood. Just a bad idea. Also, I hate raisins, so setting them on fire? Yeah, I'm out. I don't like raisins. They're gross, dude. I don't like them. Number two, crypt picks. Look, it's a part of life. 
it happens. You live, you love, and depending on how much your wife likes interior design, you probably have a sign hanging up like that in your home somewhere that says something like that. You know what I'm talking about. And after spending all that time in HomeSense, it's all over. Fade the black, cease to exist, the forever box. There's a whole process and respect in the undertaking business. The Victorian era had a strange tradition, however. How about taking photographs with the body of a family member who has recently passed on? Yeah, that's right, I know. I couldn't believe it, really. People would sit there for minutes taking photos of those who are no longer with us because the process of taking photos was not great. This isn't the digital age, after all. This is something that the Crypt Keeper would make you do. Keep, just, and, and keep them in the album or something. Just, just not, not for your everyday family, man. That's just weird. Yes, yeah, so now we're going to take photos. <laughs> like, that's just weird, you know what I mean? It's just weird, it's weird. Number one, Jack the Ripper. Listen, the women of Victorian London feared this guy, and how can you blame them? A terror that seemed to come from nowhere and could strike from anywhere. Humans unaliving other humans is nothing new, and it probably won't be old, it won't get old soon. We, we're, this is what we do, it's kind of our thing. But this was the first modern serial unaliver. Jack the Ripper's identity has never been found. It's only been speculated, and some studies suggest that it has been revealed, but it's really hard to pinpoint something that happened that long ago. He was nasty and the crimes were awful. The photographs of the crime scene do not exactly follow today's media rules or decency as it's really just horrible and it's just really messy and bloody and just gross. It's kind of hard to talk about this era without Jack the Ripper. Women should feel safe at night no matter what era it is. That's right, ladies, I'm on your side. In 10th place, we have loss of rights under marriage. Under English common law, a married woman lost her legal independence. She could not enter contracts or sue, and her property and obligations were mostly subsumed by those of her husband, the couple becoming a single legal entity. In less legalese, any property she might have had in her name, be it through a family holdings or being, you know, signed over, became her husband's and not hers the moment she signed her marriage license. Mm. Also, any personal property acquired by the wife during the marriage effectively came under the full control of her husband. A married woman was unable to dispose of any property without her husband's consent, and upon divorce, women generally had no rights to any property accumulated during marriage, usually leaving them uh, impoverished. Women were able to retain some property they possessed prior to marriage in certain cases during a divorce. Certain cases. So if your dad gifted you, say, a summer home for safety, and you wanted to divorce your husband and take back that uh, rightfully given home for your new home, yeah, uh, good luck getting that back. Besides the dowries, prenuptial agreements effectively allowed married women to maintain beneficial interest in her previously owned or inherited real property, which was placed under trusteeship, allowing her to have a separate income from her husband. Moral of this story, Sign the damn prenup. In ninth place, we have a uh, lack of consent in marriage. So in addition to losing your rights over whatever property you brought into the arrangement, if you are a girl like me, consent and rights over your own body um, didn't exist. Marriage overrode a woman's right to consent to sexual intercourse with her husband, giving him effective ownership over her body. Honestly, just add it to the dowry list. Insert man's name here uh, is to be gifted however many gold coins, a couple of cows, the right to my land, all in the rights to do what he pleases with my body. Am I ever glad I live in today's day and age, I have the right to look at that and say, uh, absolutely not. Women were expected to have sex with only one man, her husband. Just imagine a husband for me here, okay? On the flip side, it was acceptable for men to have multiple partners in their life. Some husbands had lengthy affairs with other women, while their wives stayed with their husbands because uh, divorce wasn't always an option. But if a woman had sexual conduct with another man, she was seen as ruined or fallen and considered to have violated the marriage. Yeah, gotta love a double standard. Victorian literature and art was full of examples of women paying dearly for straying from moral expectations. Adulterous met tragic ends in novels, including the ones by, you know, great writers such as Tolstoy, Flaubert, or Thomas Hardy, as opposed to the modern possibility of happiness and fulfillment from adultery. While some writers and artists showed sympathy towards women's subjugation to this double standard, some works were uh, didactic and uh, reinforced the cultural norm. In the Victorian era, sex was not discussed openly and honestly. Public discussions of sexual encounters and matters were met with uh, feigned ignorance, embarrassment, and fear. One public opinion of women's sexual desires was that they were not very troubled by sexual urges. Even if women's desires were lurking, sexual experiences came with 
consequences for women and families. Limiting family sizes resulted in resisting sexual desires, except when a husband had desires which, as a wife, women were contracted to fulfill. To discourage premarital sexual relations, the new poor law provided that women bear financial responsibilities for out-of-wedlock pregnancies. In 1834, women were made legally and financially supportive of their illegitimate children. Sexual relations for women could not just be about desire and feelings. This was a luxury reserved for men. The consequences of sexual interactions for women took away the physical desires that women could possess. In eighth place, we have purity culture. The ideal Victorian woman was pure, refined, and modest. Makes me gag to say it, but here goes nothing. This ideal was supported by etiquette and manners. The etiquette extended to the pretension of never acknowledging the use of undergarments, which would be referred to as unmentionables. The discussion of such a topic, it was feared, would gravitate towards unhealthy attention on anatomical details. As one Victorian lady expressed it, these are not things, my dear, that we speak of. Indeed, we try not even to think of them, in contrast to the modern norms of frank and constant discussion of, you know, details. Pardon me while I'm rolling my eyes here. The pretense of avoiding acknowledgement of anatomical realities met with the uh, embarrassing failure on occasion. For example, in 1859, the Honorable Eleanor Stanley wrote about an incident where the Duchess of Manchester hooped too quickly while maneuvering over a stile. Tripping over her large hoop skirt, she went head over heels, landing on her feet with her cage and her whole petticoats above her head. They say there was never such a thing seen, and the other ladies hardly knew whether to be thankful or not that a part of her undergarments consisted in a pair of scarlet tartan knickerbockers, which were revealed to the view of all all the world in general, and to the Duke de Malakoff in particular. What a scandal. However, despite the fact that Victorians considered the mention of women's undergarments in mixed company unacceptable, men's entertainment made great comedic material out of the topic of ladies' bloomers, including men's magazines and music hall skits. Ah, there's that icky double standard again. In seventh place, we have denial of education. Women were generally expected to marry and perform household and motherly duties, rather than seek a uh, formal education. Even women who were not successful in finding husbands were generally expected to remain without university degrees and to take a position as a governess or as a supporter to other members of the family. The outlook for education-seeking women improved when Queen's College in Harley Street, London, was founded in 1848. The goal of this college was to um, provide governesses with a marketable education because, you know, gotta have a governess. Later, the Cheltenham Ladies College and other girls' public schools were founded, increasing educational opportunities for women's education and leading eventually to the development of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies in 1887. I'm I'm great at entertaining the spawn of others, but I promise you all that I'm not someone you want as a mom or a teacher. Nah. -uh. In sixth place, we have lower pay. Women cannot be expected to be paid the same wage as a man for the same work. Despite the fact that women were as likely as men to be you know, married and supporting children, in 1906, the government found that the average weekly factory wage for a woman ranged from 11 cents over three days to 18 cents over eight days, whereas a man's average weekly wage was around 25 cents for nine days. Women were also preferred by many factory owners because they could be more easily induced to undergo severe bodily fatigue than men. Childminding was another necessary expense for many women working in factories. Pregnant women worked up until the day they gave birth and returned to work as soon as they were physically able. In 1891, a law was passed requiring women to take four weeks away from the factory work after giving birth, but many women could not afford this unpaid leave and the law remained unenforced. This point as a whole is still, sadly, a reality in our modern day. Many women don't make the same as men for the same jobs and are expected to do more for less. In fifth place, we have job inequality. Come on, it's not enough to pay women less. We gotta give them the crappier jobs as well. The lowest paying jobs available to working class London women were matchbox making and sorting rags in a rag factory where flea and lice ridden rags were to be sorted to be pulped for manufacturing paper. Needlework was the single largest paid occupation for women working from home, but the work paid little and women often had to rent sewing machines if they cannot purchase them. So where's that money going? These home manufacturing industries became known as sweated industries. The select committee of the House of Commons defined sweated industries in 1890 as work carried on for inadequate wages and for excessive of hours in unsanitary conditions. Wow, I'm shocked. By 1906, such workers earned about a penny an hour. In fourth place, we have limitations on hobbies. Yep because controlling a woman's body, work, and forcing her to run a household and reproduce wasn't enough. Nah. Women's physical activity was a cause of concern at the highest levels of academic research during this time. Sadly, uh, here in Canada, physicians debated the appropriateness of women using bicycles. Remember that purity culture I mentioned a moment ago? Yeah, here we go again. A series of letters published in the Dominion Medical Monthly and Ontario Medical Journal in 1896 expressed concern that women seated on a bicycle seat could have uh, an organ 
Oh no. Fearful of unleashing and creating a nation of oversexed females, some physicians urged colleagues to encourage women to give up modern dangers and continue to pursue traditional leisure pursuits. Seriously. However, not all medical colleagues were convinced of the link between cycling and and this debate on women's leisure activities continued well into the 20th century. In the early part of the 19th century, it was believed that physical activity was dangerous and inappropriate for women. Girls were taught to reserve their delicate health for the express purpose of birthing healthy children, and one of these considered benefits of the corset was to restrict respiration. Don't worry, I'll get back to corset hell and meths in just a moment. Furthermore, the physiological differences between the sexes helped to reinforce the societal inequality. An anonymous female writer was able to contend that women were not intended to fill male roles because women are, as a rule, physically smaller and weaker than men, their brain is much lighter, and they are in every way unfitted for the same amount of bodily or mental labor that men are able to undertake. Well, pardon me and my tiny brain. Can I be excused and paid to go sit on a fainting couch? In third place, we have corset trends. I'm gonna start this by making sure everyone knows that I'm emphasizing the harmful trends, not dismissing corsets as a whole. I'm personally a huge fan of corsets and various historical shapewear, since when worn properly, they're actually quite comfortable and beneficial to one's health and posture. Improperly worn corsets, or ones worn too tight, can cause a variety of problems. And my displaced ribs are a sad example of that. Anyhow, allow me to continue before I sidetrack myself to infinity and beyond. Victorian women's clothing followed trends that emphasized elaborate dresses. Skirts with wide volume created by the use of layered materials such as crinolines, hoop skirt frames, and heavy fabrics. The ideal silhouette of the time demanded a narrow waist, which was accomplished by constricting the abdomen with a tightly laced corset. While the silhouette was striking, and the dresses themselves were often exquisitely detailed creations, the fashions weren't ideal. At best, they restricted women's movements, and at worst, they had a harmful effect on women's health. Physicians turned their attention to the use of corsets and uh, determined that they caused several medical problems. Compression of the thorax, restricted breathing, organ displacement, poor circulation, and a uh, prolapsed uterus. Oh no, can't harm that baby making factory. Articles advocating the reform of women's clothing by the British National Health Society, the Ladies Dress Association, and the Rational Dress Society were reprinted in the Canada Lancet, Canada's medical journal. Nowadays, corsets are a choice, not a necessity, and I often prefer them over the more popular underwire bra. In second place, we have Magdalene Asylums. So Magdalene, As so Magdalene Asylums, also known as Magdalene Laundries, were initially Protestant, but later mostly Roman Catholic institutions that operated from the 18th to the late 20th centuries to house uh, fallen women. The institutions were named after the biblical figure Mary Magdalene, who in you know, earlier centuries characterized as a reformed lady of the night. The term referred to female sexual promiscuity or work in undesirable fields, young women who became pregnant outside of marriage, or young women who just didn't have familial support. They were required to work without pay. Apart from meager food provisions, well, the institutions operated large commercial laundries, serving customers outside of their bases. Many of these laundries were effectively operated as penitentiary workhouses. The strict regimes of the institutions were often more severe than those found in prisons. This contradicted the perceived outlook that they were meant to help women, as opposed to uh, punishing them. The last one known closed only in 1996, which is a year before I was born, so they went on for way too long. In our first place, we have Woman of the Night. During the Victorian age, women selling their bodies was a wide-scale problem in Britain. The very essence of it went against every moral value that was promoted during this time. Values such as, you know, chastity, prudence, and grace were dismissed and disregarded by fallen women. These women were led into this line of work for varying reasons, the most prominent being, you know, social and economic concerns. Upon entering into this world, there were several different avenues that could be taken by women, including military encampments, brothels, and, um, street walking. The number of women participating in this trade during the Victorian age was uh, staggeringly high. Although London police reports recorded that you know there were approximately 8,600 women of the night known to them, it has been suggested that the true number during this time was closer to 80,000. As a result, concerns were raised and the prominence led to several government acts. Goodness forbid a woman try and make money for herself on her own terms through selling something that would already be part of a dowry. This act would allow women to barter within the marketplace without influence of men who would often take their earnings and goods. And that brings us to the end of our list and I'm sure you can see the smoke pouring out of my ears. Oh gosh, what a scandal. I've been talking about women's undergarments, sexuality, and been paid to do so. I'm definitely a modern gal, and a queer one who is very happy to be living in the time I'm currently in. Sure, things are far from perfect, but I have rights over my body, and marriage is a choice, not a living. Number 10 is chloroform the hiccups away. Nowadays, we know a nasty case of hiccups is curable by just holding your breath or chugging a bunch of water. But if this was 1899, you'd be prescribed chloroform. Known by many as the mysterious liquid on the rag, 
gag placed over the someone's face to make them faint in many period pieces or cartoons, chloroform gained popularity after Queen Victoria demanded its usage during her labor in 1853, after having been denied it in her previous labors. By taking these lengths to reduce the annoyance of hiccups, your vital organs may pay a steep price. Chloroform has the potential to damage the nervous system, lungs, and trachea, as well as the liver and kidney when exposed long term. This is just one of many medical remedies that we'll be covering from the first Merrick Manual of Diagnosis and Therapy, the oldest continuously published English language medical textbook. All the quack treatments in our list today used to be found in this mass encyclopedia. For instance, number 9 in our countdown is smoke inhalation for asthma and other lung conditions. This may be one of the more counterintuitive remedies on our list, as it's easy to see now that smoke is not beneficial for asthma at all. Through the late 19th and into the next, however, inhaling smoke or smoke as well as stramonium, a hallucination inducing nightshade, as well as lobelia, known for its sedative properties, were popular treatments for asthmatics. Asthma is caused when your airways can narrow or swell while producing excess mucus. Smoking meanwhile has been shown to eventually reduce the number of cilia, the lungs filaments which help transport mucus into the lungs, which only leads to the worsening of asthma symptoms. This wasn't the only weird tobacco smoke belief however, in 1872 an English newspaper talked of tobacco smoke enemas which even reported that hundreds of lives might have been spared by the tobacco smoke enema. Okay. Weird enough. Plasters, no not the British word for band-aids, is number 8. This medical treatment was said to have sucked the badness out of a person. They were like a nicotine patch made up of a thin layer sheet of wax as well as leather and it was able to stick onto the skin. In the wax there were remedies such as lead, opium, frankincense, tobacco, etc. This mix would be applied while still warm to ensure the adhesion of the plaster. Plasters were sold to anyone of any age and came in many different shapes and sizes so that they may be applied to different areas. Areas. What were they used for? Everything. Cough, cold, period pain, organ failure, alcoholism, headache, the list can go on forever. Seeing as they wanted the patch to pull as much badness from the body as possible, these patches could be left on for two days to two weeks to forever. Without washing, of course. Naturally, these patches trapped in a lot of moisture that could cause infections, blisters, rashes, and hives underneath, especially once the patch is removed and the skin is finally exposed to air. Arsenic, like plasters, was a cure all and it's number 7 in the countdown. If you've seen our other video, Top 10 Unusual Fashion Trends from the Victorian Era, you might know that arsenic was in everything in the Victorian era. Makeup, wallpaper, dye. No exception was made in medicine either as arsenic was prescribed for anything from anemia in Merrick's diagnosis manual to anthrax, cancer, reduced libido, syphilis, or even cholera. While it was most popular to consume arsenic, it could also be inhaled or injected. Being a byproduct of smelting, it's no wonder arsenic was everywhere during the industrial revolution as there was an excess of it. So it was incredibly accessible and a household remedy. Since doctors already prescribed it to do so much, everyday people just start to use it to treat any common ailment. Unsurprisingly, many people suffered arsenic poisoning symptoms. The ailments are now referred to as Fowler's disease. Number 6 is all kinds of gross and questionable. The everlasting pill. When the Merck manual was first published, part of the comprehensive treatment plan for an eruptive fever, which is a classification for diseases like scarlet fever, smallpox, and chickenpox, was actually laxatives. Castor oil was the main laxative choice for Victorians up until the debut of the everlasting pill, made up of a metal now known to be toxic called antimony, would be invented. Swallowing this would induce severe vomiting and diarrhea, thus giving the body what they thought to be a healthy cleanse and their intention was to purge diseases from the body. It earned the name the everlasting pill as the pill would pass through the gastric system mostly intact, meaning it could be retrieved and cleaned for future use. Seeing as the metal was greatly valuable at the time, it was quite common to keep it in the family and hand it down generation to generation. Imagine getting that in your granny's will. Watch out, it may shock ya. Number 5 is shock treatment. When profit can be made off of insecurity, unsavory business flourishes. Victorians honed in on the man's moral weaknesses as a cause for erectile dysfunction, and impotence was thought to be caused by either too much sex and masturbation or not enough. So doctors took a few shocking routes, literally, such as galvantic baths or bathtubs filled with electrodes, which were supposed to restore sexual desire in an advertised six sessions. For a more direct approach, a thin rod with running electric current could be placed up into a man's
Repeat that twice a week about 5 minutes each time and your little man should be ready to rumble. By the late 1800s, ads were running for electric belts aimed at weak men. They claimed to help cure kidney pain and sciatic nerve issues and backaches and headaches and nervous exhaustion and of course, mainly their dysfunction. While today impotence is recognized as the result of physical or mental duress, age or genetics, the belief that electric shock therapy is a useful cure for impotence still persists and some studies have shown positive signs. See that fellas? Don't knock it till you try it. Speaking of electrocuting genitals, you can't tell me that didn't happen at least once with the first electric vibrators, which is number 4 in our countdown. Female hysteria became a diagnosable medical condition way back in medieval times when the concept of a wandering uterus, when a discontented or displaced uterus would cause a woman ill health, was first coined. Believed to have symptoms such as irritability, insomnia, fainting, anxiety, menstruation, or horniness, pretty much every woman showed these symptoms. Hysteria was pretty common. Doctors cure hysterical paroxysm, an orgasm. For hundreds of years leading up to this invention, doctors were manually administering pelvic massages to women to achieve the necessary cure. But all that wrist work added up over time and doctors needed a break. So cue Dr. Joseph Mortimer Granville, he created an electric steam powered electromechanical medical instrument, nicknamed the manipulator. The device allowed women to give themselves home massages to cure their wandering wounds and giving doctors the well deserved break they needed. A questionable cure for a very questionable diagnosis. Number 3 is not for the faint of heart. They loved leeches. It may be crazy to imagine, but between the late 1700s and well into the early 1900s, there was a booming leech trade all across Europe. Leeches were shipped from Germany to America by the tens of thousands. England even had to start importing them from France by the mid 1800s as their own leech stocks were not even enough to supply their own doctors. Francis Bersoyas believed that all diseases resulted from the excess buildup of blood and documented this belief in a medical journal that would subsequently cause leeches to become the go to treatment in France and then later spread across Europe. This usage of leeches then became worldwide from there and so obscene that the creatures started to go extinct. However, what these quacks didn't know is that bloodletting was very 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 rarely beneficial to any conditions and applying leeches often resulted in detrimental side effects such as blood loss, diarrhea and vomiting or those with poor immune systems could even be exposed to hazardous bacteria and infection. Let alone death from hemorrhagic shock for literally anyone they did this to. Eventually the excessive use of leeches meant that they became too expensive to ship, too scarce due to the over farming to find, and medically obsolete in the face of new science that questioned the medical merits of bloodletting. Thank god. Number 2 doesn't allow you to touch where number 1 usually comes out. It's the masturbatory mental illness. Obviously it's natural, normal and well fun, but the Victorian perspective of masturbation was nowhere near what it is today. As our Old timely friends saw it as a serious threat to mental and physical health or even could kill you. Self love was seen as an ultimate evil, but beyond moralistic arguments many physicians thought that every orgasm drained a mans energy. Married men were warned by doctors to limit the amount of sex they were having, while unmarried men were encouraged and urged to conserve their essence by avoiding sex altogether, particularly masturbation. Even wet dreams and uncontrolled ejaculation were considered a sexual disorder function as masturbation essentially became the male version of hysteria. So how did you treat this condition? Men had to stop masturbating. Fear and shame campaigns did what they do best and stimulated the market to provide quick quack remedies. They came in the form of anti-masturbation devices that looked like torture chambers. Most popular was the jugum, which was a metal ring attached around the base of a man's, you know, and then screwed on. If he was to become erect at any point, whether awake or asleep, the now inflated skin would make contact with sharp metal teeth that would dig in. Like I said, most popular. Consider how much worse these other options were for that to be the primo choice. A spermatic truss was essentially the first jock strap, but meant for every day. And the Bowden device fastened a little metal helmet to the end of a man's member that bound up into his pubic hair so that it would be ripped out should he become erect. I'm more than happy to keep going, but I'm sure more than enough people are wincing right now. Keep in mind, while these men were going through this to avoid masturbation, women were being prescribed it as a cure. 
Number one on our countdown may be a bit of a surprise, surgery. How could surgery be a questionable treatment? Well, it itself isn't, but the men performing it and their hygiene towards surgery were. Most famous is Robert Liston, said to be able to remove a leg in 30 seconds, he notoriously used his own mouth to hold scalpels, knives, and even once sucked the pus out of a woman's throat wound. According to medical historian Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris, surgeons never washed their instruments or their hands, and Victorian surgeons were known for wearing old surgery garments out of prowess, reportedly so stiff with old blood that they were nearly cardboard in appearance. Even the operating tables themselves were rarely washed down, and it was said a visitor to St. George's Hospital in London 1825 discovered mushrooms and maggots thriving in the damp, dirty sheets of a patient's bed. When asked why they hadn't complained, the patient assumed this to be the norm. And what about surgery in the moment? Well, the patients were conscious and undrugged as they were operated on, and surgeries needed to be fast as a result. One in four people died after their surgery, whether it was still on the operating table or from infections afterwards. But what about her buddy I mentioned, Dr. Liston? Only 1 in 10 of his patients died. This was because of his speed. Time me gentlemen, time me, he'd shout to the surgery spectators to put his legendary speed to the test. Sure, he did accidentally castrate somebody once because of his wild motions, but nobody's perfect. In fact, while he's remembered for being the first surgeon to use anesthesia, wash his knives, and invent a still used medical tool, he is the only surgeon to ever have a 300% death rate. I'd be remiss not to mention that during a leg amputation, his lightning speed reportedly cut off three fingers of the assistant who had been holding down the patient. Then as he brought the knife back up, he slashed the coat of a spectator. The spectator reportedly died immediately of fright, likely a heart attack. Though the assistant and patient survived initially, like most who were treated in Victorian hospitals, they died not long after from infection, which was also just called hospitalism at the time because of how many people died that way. It's easy to say that going to a Victorian Victorian surgery or a hospital may have been as efficient as rubbing dirt into a wound. Number 10, the fuzzy wonder. Growing up, I had the classic red toy car. It was great. I would honk the horn, slam the door with attitude, wearing a diaper. It was the perfect invention for a youngin like me. But back in the Victorian era, the toys or whatever, not as fun. Definitely not as fun. Fisher Price wasn't born yet, so if you wanted to wheel around and kill time, maybe even have a few laughs, well, you had to use this. The fuzzy wonder. Yeah, this uh, let's unpack this one, shall we? This patent, I'll be honest, this patent here makes me think. It makes me wonder more than anything. Why didn't this change history? Are you kidding me? The fuzzy seat, the gears, the foot straps, the possibilities are endless with the fuzzy wonder. The only thing that we do know about this patent, the only hint as to who or what this was for is written right below the product's name. It says, the fuzzy wonder, the champion of his species. His species? You're telling me there's more of these? Where's the fuzzy champion? Let's take him for a spin. He's probably got an engine. It's probably great. I go shopping riding one of these for sure. Definitely wheeling around, throwing stuff in. Easy. Number nine, top hat cigar holders. Yeah, this one here is so Victorian. I love it. In the Victorian era, smoking cigars was a popular pastime amongst wealthy men. If you were rich, you had to smoke cigars all day, every day, and then cough non-stop. Cigar holders, of course, were used to prevent the cigar smoke from directly entering the smoker's mouth and to keep the cigar cool and on your persons. There were various types of cigar holders during the Victorian era, ranging from simple wooden or metal tubes to more elaborate designs made of ivory, silver, or sometimes gold. Fancy schmancy. Some holders were designed to be attached at the end of a walking stick, while others could be worn as a pendant on a chain, or in this case, for some reason, a top hat. Yeah, why is there smoke coming from that man's head? I wonder if he's okay. Oh, he's just bad. That's cool. My mistake, sir. Continue on with your Victorian cigar stroll. Yeah, people's heads were smoking. They would keep all of them lit on their top hat. What a weird place to hold them. Cigar holders were often personalized with the owner's initials or family crest, and they were considered a status symbol, although it looked ridiculous on a top hat. This was a way to flex your wealth, you know what I mean? There were no broke boys walking around with top hats. No way. Or cigar holders on said top hats. No way, that's insane. That's a lot of weight on a hat. I'd be, I'd be doing this a lot. Number eight, the fork and knife cleaner. In theory, in the Victorian era, this one sounds great, but it also seems like way more effort than just hand washing, you know? I don't know, let's talk about it. Invented in 1850 by Thomas Parker in Kensington, the knife and fork cleaner in the 1850s, it was pretty significant. It was the 
big improvement in the process of cleaning cutlery, a bit, I guess. Prior to this invention, cleaning knives and forks was a time-consuming and often challenging task. Definitely harder than it is today to wash a dish. The knife and fork cleaner consisted of a handheld device with multiple bristles and brushes and gears that would all fit around the knife or the fork, and then it would spin and move around. Again, looks like a saw trap. The user would then rub the utensil back and forth through the bristles to remove any food or debris. It took a while, and like I'm saying, a little bit more effort, probably. This invention was particularly used for commercial kitchens where large quantities of cutlery needed to be cleaned quickly, so restaurants, whatever. It was also popular among households, even though it didn't last too long. It's definitely worth a mention. It looks scary more than anything. I wouldn't be like, ugh, clean up my fork, like don't eat my arm, thank you. Number seven, Vigor's horse action saddle. All right, now we're into it, here we go. I mentioned the fuzzy wonder earlier. This thing here, Vigor's horse action saddle. Yeah, action saddle, We've got some action here, there we go. This saddle would sit somewhere in your home, ideally in a place where no one else could see you. That's great, that's a start. The way they marketed this thing back then, they made it sound like it was an actual health benefit riding this <laughs> big vibrator, for lack of a better term. That's all it did, it just vibrated and you sat on it. That's all I'll say, that's all I'm allowed to say. On the patent, it states that Vigor's horse action saddle can promote good spirits, it quickens circulation, it stimulates the liver, and probably other places, and it even creates an appetite. Yeah, all that and the thing that shakes you up in the corner of your house. Imagine it's the Victorian era and you have to watch your drunk uncles take turns riding this thing all weekend long. This is far too intimate for the family room. This is kind of gross. Yeah, it vibrates a lot and really hard, so that's it. You can do the rest. You can think the rest of the thoughts, dirty freaks. Number six, the toilet mask. Madame Rowley's toilet mask. Okay, where do I even begin with this one? At first, I thought that this was a mask that you had to wear while you took a shit. I mean, compared to everything else on this list, I was like, yeah, sure. People would wear the Phantom of the Opera masks every time they had to go to the washroom. Probably, who knows? They were weird back then. A toilet mask was not that, I mean, not too far from that. The toilet mask was a natural beautifier for bleaching and preserving your skin. <laughs> Victorian bleach, <laughs> easy, that's fun. The patent even stated that this mask would remove complexion imperfections. Complexion imperfections, see you later. Huh, what a treat, how lucky are we? All you have to do is wear this mask three times a week. For how long? I don't know, doesn't say. Just feel it out, I guess. Just feel out the bleach. Turns out lead cosmetics pasted onto a mask and bleach. Turns out it was not beneficial for your health at all. Who knew? Not me. Ah, uh, yes, let me put on my bleach mask before, well, I can't breathe or see anymore. Never mind, I'm gonna stop wearing that. Number five. Automatic smoking machines. When I read about this, I actually laughed my ass off for like a minute straight. I get some of these inventions or where these inventions were trying to go. Like an indoor saddle, sure, that's fun, I guess, if you want it to be. The mask at the time was thought to have beauty benefits. The automatic smoking machine was all bad. I don't see any good thing about this thing. It's not even designed well, it looks like sh in the corner. It was just a machine that smoked all of your cigarettes. Yeah, it smoked them automatically and then blew the smoke all over your curtains. What a great invention. Nice, 10 out of 10. Gonna review that. What a perfect addition to the family. This thing, first of all, was not small. It was not petite. It looked like a saw trap placed in the corner. It was so Victorian and scary looking. There's gears and pulleys and they're like, there's smoke pluming out of random places. It's like having a choo-choo train in your house. Who wants this? A choo-choo train that gave you lung cancer. Nice, score. Merry Christmas. Yeah, fire it up. It only takes 80 cigarettes at a time. I know. Number four, the surprise chair. Are you tired of sitting down on chairs that, you know, stay still and don't immediately topple back once you apply any amount of pressure? Well, don't I have just the thing for you? Here we go. The surprise Victorian chair. I guess it was invented for laughs in a world before Netflix. Sure, I guess. You have to be creative. There's no sign of practicality in this patent, so we're gonna go ahead and assume that these 1800s folks, they were hilarious. They loved a practical gag. I'm not even gonna say prank. Don't even make me say prank, YouTube. I'm not saying the P word. The patent shows the exact science here and what it takes to surprise your guest and then have them topple to the ground. I go, ah, ha, ha, then you bring them back up and then give them the real chair. This is a prank gift, and if we've learned anything in time, getting prank gifts, it only works once. So once you get your pal to take a topple in the 1800s, you would then have to store this heavy, antique, horrible looking heavy chair somewhere in your home and then bring the real chair back. Again, it sounds like way too much effort for a very low payoff. Imagine that, 400 pound chair. They're like, yeah, gotcha. All right, who next? Number three, toilet troubles. Now the Victorian era, it was 
It was unsanitary to say the least, sure, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect. Some random poo-poo signs coming out of you. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was the bathroom. I love this one, it's great. Now, it took a few tries to figure out the whole methane gas problem, but we did it. Yeah, spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common in the V era. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, well, they built up over time with human waste. And more human waste than just, well, so much sh and gases, it built up in the sewers and eventually it backed up into our homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and then your bathroom's gone and you're gone and there's sh everywhere and it's the Victorian era and you're like, what do I even do right now? What just happened? What science was that? Number two, the wave rockin' bath. Seaside at home, let's do it. Are you tired of regular bathtubs that are stationary, relaxing, and don't soak your entire floor in minutes? Well, the Niagara wave rockin' bath washes all that away. Yep, see you later. This bathtub was designed to rock, literally. It kept your blood in active circulation, apparently, and it only required three pails of water. Also a bull. The patent promised the fullest illusion of a sea or a river bath, whilst promising absolutely no water will splash on the floor. Yeah, good joke, no way that's gonna happen. And it didn't happen because that's way too good to work out. Imagine having this now growing up, are you kidding me? My mom would be yelling at me to clean up the floor immediately. I already made enough splashes with just a stationary bathtub. I don't want a, a rocking bathtub. I'm trying to rinse my hair, I'm like, this sucks. Everywhere. It's so stupid. Just doing this is so stupid. Looking at lights. Finally, number one, beauty patches. Oh, we need to bring back beauty patches ASAP. Imagine me right now doing this list with an 800s beauty patch. You'd hit that thumbs up immediately. You'd be like, this Victorian man is straight out of time. These patches came in all shapes and sizes. Now, even in this portrait from 1755, quite a ways ago, Joshua Reynolds painted Charles, the ninth Lord Carthart, rocking a large beauty patch. These beauty patches go way back. Also, look at him. That's a Lord right there with that He's confident, got one of those, he's great. Beauty patches in the 1800s, they were small, tiny circles, sometimes even hearts or stars, which is, that's pretty fun, you go. Now the reason for these patches, and sometimes having more than one, is because they were commonly used to cover up smallpox scars. Yeah, we found out your secret, you Victorian era gentlemen. They were made out of silk velvet and they were applied with glue, so if you pick a spot, you better be confident. The patches were dark black and they were also meant to make your pale skin pop, which again, imagine if I had one right now, you'd be blind. I'm so pale as is already. If I put one of those patches on, I'm going to be able to see the screen. You're turning that brightness down real quick. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. Historian Joseph Addison took note of these positions when observing two political parties from back in the 1800s. One party had beauty patches on the right side of their face, while the other side had the opposite. Today we have uh, Twitter. Yeah, usually you can tell someone's political allegiance by just taking a glimpse of that. You're like, oh dear, no, that's, we don't want to talk to that guy. He's a, he's a right patch kind of guy. Number 10, Queen Victoria. It's all blighty herself. Her Royal Majesty and Queen of the British Empire. Queen Victoria, she's responsible for a lot of things, including a nice long holiday in the summer where dads get to be irresponsible with fireworks. Nice. All fun jokes aside, she was the queen of the monarch and she wasn't the worst queen ever, but uh, during her reign, the British Empire had never really been stronger as it took part in absorbing many smaller nations into the empire. And they didn't ask nicely if you catch my drift. India, China, and uh, a lot of parts of Africa. Africa had a rough time back then. It was, it was pretty hard for that continent. They all felt the wrath of the Queen's expansionist fist. It's really sad, actually. Goddamn. Number nine, Thebes. Times, specifically in Victorian London, weren't the best. It most certainly wasn't the cleanliest place on earth, and there were orphans asking for more porridge. I don't know. I didn't read the book, guys. Sorry. Lack of rights, social expectations and pressure, and a lot of double standards. Honestly, it just wasn't an easy time for women. Well, it shouldn't really come as a surprise, but thievery and pickpocketing were often done even by women, though. I mean, what choice do you have at that point? The idea of ladies was so ladylike or elegant that it wasn't possible, or at least people thought it wasn't possible, that they could be criminals. What a backhanded compliment. Well, are women a criminal? I certainly don't think so, sir. It's not possible. 
It's very possible. There are tons of thieves and pickpockets. That's just ridiculous. Number eight, Jane Toppin. Take a trip with me to Boston. We can see Bunker Hill, Old North Church, and Fanu Hall. Ooh, cool. We could also visit a very nice nurse from the 1880s who was taking care of the elderly. Jolly Jane, as she became to be known, was a nurse who took care of the elderly. And by take care, I mean the same way you took care of your first hamster. Mmm, yeah, not so great, was it? Now, how did he know that? I know. She would dose up the old geezers with a healthy Keith Richards sized dose of morphine. Yeah! There's only so much rock stars that can handle that level of rock and roll. And guys, grandma and grandpa, they're not one of them. They can't handle that kind of stuff. After that, she would lay down with them and just like chill with the body, because that's, that's what you do. Ugh. Before she was caught, there was an estimated 31 grandmas and grandpas not at the dinner table after having her as a nurse. I'm just gonna lay down right beside you. It's gonna be great. Just gonna lay down. <laughs> Number seven, Typhoid Mary. My mom wasn't the best cook on planet Earth, but God willing, she tried. You know, she she really put in a lot of work. Excuse the meme here, but she makes a mean spaghetti though. God, I love mom's spaghetti. I really, I really do. And her cookies. Oh, she makes the best cookies. Everyone should agree with me in the comment section so I can show my mom and tell her she hasn't made cookies in a while. Tell my mom to mix with cookies. It's time she makes cookies, man. They're so freaking good. They're the best on earth, I swear. Oh, well, my mother is okay. She doesn't make up the Gordon Ramsay standards, but that's okay because no matter how well Typhoid Mary made the lamb sauce, it was always gonna make people green as Typhoid Mary was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid fever. Yes, that's what we're talking about, Typhoid Mary. Crazy enough, after she found out that she was asymptomatic with typhoid, she insisted upon cooking. She kept going, which got more people sick. Surprise. She was forcibly quarantined multiple times in her life. You can't make this stuff up. Please stop cooking, you're sick. I'm gonna do what I want, you can't tell me what to do. Number six, Bell Star. You know, for those who enjoy adult entertainment, her name kind of sounds like it came from there, right? Anyway, she was a cowgirl and outlaw in the 1880s and in the Lone Star State. She was married to an Indian and oftentimes as a couple would offer help to other outlaws needing refuge at their ranch. In 1883, her and her husband were caught trying to steal a horse, very RDR of them, hmm, and spent time in the old slammer. They continued their outlaw ways until it all went Dutch Vanderlyn, meaning it didn't go very well. One day, like any other good western, a stranger had come to the ranch, kind of out of nowhere, and gave Bell Star a taste of the law. Just happened to be with a big iron. To this day, nobody knows what happened, who the stranger was, or why she was bang bang. No one, no one knows. No one, no one. It's crazy. There, was, there should be a movie about that. Big iron on his hip, all fancy anyway. Number five, Mary Surratt. I actually didn't know this one, but perhaps maybe our American audience remembers. Some will recall a time when America was divided in twain. After all, a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. A certain top-hatted bearded president did his best to restore the union. It took a lot of years and lives, but he managed to do it. However, some were still not pleased, a one John Wilkes Booth to be specific had to ask the president a leaded question, if you catch my drift. Well, after assassinating one of the most beloved presidents in American history, he needed to hide. You, you gotta hide after that. And Mary Surratt was the woman who'd let him hide. So I think aiding and abetting, as well as harboring the most wanted man in America at the time, counts as scandalous. She also had some other anti-union behavior as well. Hmm, that's not good. Nazi, Nazi, not very nice. Number four, Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden took in gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Huh, isn't that nice? <laughs> oh boy. Yes, that's right, the late 1800s teenage daughter who maybe perhaps pulled an OJ Simpson. Nah, we're not sure, I don't know. Maybe she did not sort of brutally unalive her families. <laughs> no one else was found at the scene and then she was acquitted. That sounds just like OJ. Which, given how women were treated back in the day, is kind of strange because I, it just feels like women who are clearly not guilty were punished for stuff they didn't do, and women who are for sure guilty get off free. Her alibi was that she was in the barn when it happened, and then she walked to the house and, Mom and Dad, what's going on here? Let me just wash off my bloody, my bloody shorts here. What? Whoa, who did that? What? That's crazy. Number three, Mary Ann Cotton. Marriage can be tough. 
sure. But Marianne Cotton is the reason today you can't collect on life insurance when your spouse mysteriously, get your finger quotes out, mysteriously passes away. It all started when she predicted the passing of her stepson. And then it happened. That's weird. After that, it was her husband here, and then another husband there, and well, it's starting to get a little fishy, don't you think? Well, once these unexpected passings were looked into, they all had something in common, something in their tummies. Arsenic. Yes, she was getting rid of her husbands and then trying to claim the insurance money. Evil, but ahead of her time, like 50 years ahead of her time. That's that's insurance fraud. That's interesting. And, well, it's also it's also like cold-blooded, cl calculated, unaliving, you know. But but insurance fraud too. <laughs> Number two, Tilly Kilmick. Okay, how about a literal psychic who knew when all of our late husbands were going to pass? In the late Victorian era, Tilly Kilmick was first found predicting the passing of scruffy wild dogs in the ghettos of Chicago. It's kind of a weird thing to say, like, mm, yeah, see that dog? The dog's not gonna make it. The dog? No, he's not gonna make it. Anyway, <laughs> somehow she always knew when they were going to expire. Then it was her late husband of 29 years. That's kind of strange, 29 years, and he ends up, hmm, that's weird. After cashing the insurance money, which she got immediately, she started dating immediately, where oblivious man after man kept passing, and very shortly after she married more and more. Well, she was a regular Marianne Cotton, to say the least, as she too was using arsenic on her husband to collect insurance money. She eventually was arrested, and her stipulation for being in prison was that she was not allowed to cook for anyone. I think that's fair. That's good. Don't let her cook. Don't, that's a good idea. Number one, ladies of the evening. Love them, hate them, or spend a lot of money on them in Vegas. That's, that's, that's Las Vegas, baby. The era was defined by them, especially in London. Ooh, baby. I mean, at night, you really couldn't walk anywhere without a fair lass daintily waving her hand in hopes of luring in a customer, which wasn't really an issue given that bedroom-related sicknesses were at an all-time high. Syphilis specifically had shockingly high percentage of the population and would make you think twice. Well, it would make us think twice, it would make me think twice, but people back then, uh, they kind of just went for it. Raw, is something wrong with you, love? I don't care, let's go anyway. Number 10, train engine cleaner. Ever wanted to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out the coal that was left in there? Ever wanted to go underneath a train where you can't fully stand up in the middle of the night and rake out a dusty ash pan, getting all kinds of ash and stuff in your mouth? Perfect! You can go join up with the railroad as a train engine cleaner. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains, and then spend their nights climbing into said furnace, cleaning it out, and then going out in the middle of the freezing cold, wet night into a trench covered in water and oil and dust, and get right up under that sucker and pull out all the ashes and dust and crap that came out of the engine while it had been running all day. Number Number 9. Linker Boy or Linker Men Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, the only gas lighting came in the form of small children who made you believe that you wouldn't be able to walk the streets without them tagging along with a torch to help guide your way. Then they'd expect a tip from you. Oh, rascals. They weren't so bad. They were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to point B while being able to see one foot in front of the other. And their charge was usually just one farthing, or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker boy, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from the time, and there were even some rather infamous ones, like Lawrence Casey, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Oi, where you going mate? You forgot to like and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and while I've got your attention, why not take a little peek over at our Facebook, where you'll find behind the scenes content. Get on with it! All right, all right, bloody hell, bloody hell. Number eight, knock her up. No, not like that. God. Look. I despise my alarm clock. It wakes me out of my deeply deserved beauty sleep at 6 a.m. every weekday morning. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is a knocker up, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. If you had this job, well, you're not alive anymore, but I hate you. The people at the time were somewhat friendlier than they are now, and I'm sure the knocker upper wasn't a horrible person, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy gills who would put their hand on your chest for doing this to them. Number seven, a phrenologist. I think if this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna 
go and make up a science. It worked for phrenologists. They claimed that a person's personality, character traits, and abilities could all be figured out by bumps and indents on a person's skull. Characteristics like secretiveness, amativeness, conjugality, and combativeness were apparently controlled by areas of the brain that they called organs of the brain. The idea was dismissed by the church, but it nonetheless gained traction through Europe and was really popular in the States. The idea that you could modify these organs through self-control and practice sounded really good to self-help gurus at the time. If only it was real. Number six, a dog whipper. Looking for someone who absolutely despises dogs and doesn't mind being despised by the rest of us otherwise known as a dog whipper. Back in the day, huntsmen would often hunt foxes and nail their tails to church doors, which would attract dogs of the streets. You'd also have churchgoers who would bring their dogs with them to church. These dogs were not allowed in though, so they'd all have to wait outside. You know how dogs are though. They didn't just sit there waiting patiently. I'm sure some good boys and girls did, but more often than not, they'd be playing and sometimes fighting, disrupting the church services. Enter the dog whipper, who was armed with tongs to grab a dog and remove it from the church grounds, and a whip that would be used on the loudest of the poor pooches. Number five. A rat catcher. I know this will make a few of you out there squirm in your seats. Rats in Victorian England were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your house, from the basement to the pipes. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So of course, where there is a problem, there is a job. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era and were highly praised in society, but the job wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into the dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and catching and often killing thousands of rats a year. Often rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats too. I don't know though, it's gonna be me. Number four, an upright worker. Upright workers, otherwise known as chimney sweeps, actually started off being children as young as the age of four. The smaller size of the little kiddos was perfect for fitting inside and climbing up and down chimneys. The little suckers would rub their elbows and knees up against the brick of the chimney so much that they would be scraped raw before callousing. Isn't that lovely? No. No, it's not. It's horrible. Some children were deliberately underfed to keep them small enough to do the job. Some of them would get permanent lung damage from the dust and smut and smoke from the chimney. Some kids even got stuck in the chimneys. Thank the Lord they eventually passed a law that would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to be a chimney sweep. But even then, tis not a profession many would like to have. Number three, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era. They definitely existed, as the first one was invented in 1823, but it was not exactly a portable thing. So matches were your match. The first match was invented in 1805, but it sucked. The first friction activated match came about in 1826, and they were made with white phosphorus, which is extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was actually mainly done by teenage girls and in the worst of conditions too. Forget protective gear. Oh, you wanna take your lunch break away from the highly toxic white phosphorus? Oh, no, no, no. That's right, these girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Mmm, yes, my favorite seasoning. Number two. Resurrectionists. Back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of the line. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around, which led to a good price for bodies that were in reasonably good condition, other than being deceased. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, as now you've created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves, becoming resurrectionists. A cool name for an absolutely god-awful profession, if you could call it that. The problem was bad enough that people would actually guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. No one should have to do that. Number one, night soil man. All right, if you need me, I'll be depositing my night soil over in the toilet. Poop, night soil is poop. And the night soil man, well, you see, before we had real sewer systems, the night soil you deposited at home would go into a lovely hole in the ground. As you can imagine, these would tend to fill up over time, and that's when you have your night soil men come in. Yes, his job was to clear out the poop deposits from houses and cart it away in the middle of the night so nobody in polite society would have to see it. But they were always in business, so that makes the job a little less crappy. 
Number 10, knocker upper. All right, sounds a little different than its actual purpose. Hear me out. Alarm clocks, they're not great, right? They suck, no doubt about it. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real life person. What does that look like? What does that sound like, rather? That's 6 a.m. That person is called a knocker upper, a person employed solely to wake up workers at mills and factories on those early morning shifts. Now, going from house to house, using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows, that sounds like the best job ever, right? I can't close the list with this one. This is number 10, for sure, it's kind of fun. If you had this job, well, you're probably not alive anymore. I don't know, unless you live in a weird town. The people at the time were a lot friendlier back then than they are now, so, you know, I'm sure the knocker upper came around today, be a little different. They'd probably be on World Star the next day. Knocker upper is back in the day. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for waking me up. I would have lost $14, thank you. It was a big deal, it was definitely a big deal. Number nine, the linkerman. Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, if you were traveling alone at night, well, you'd probably get lost because yeah, even London now would get lost, you know what I mean? So that's where a linkerman would ideally come into play. They'd come in to save your night. What they would do is they would carry with them a torch to help guide your way home. They'd be like, hey, follow me, I know these streets, and then you'd do it, I guess? It's a little scary. At the end of this impromptu tour, they'd of course expect a little tip from you. Of course, of course, thank you for lighting my path and getting me home, cheers. Here's one nickel. It's actually a lot back then. Here's one penny, there we go. They weren't so bad, they were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to B, whilst also being able to see one foot in front of the other. That doesn't hurt, especially in Victorian London. You gotta step on a dirty rat, that'll be gross. It's like a friend walking you home, only you don't know them, and it's the Victorian era, so probably pretty unsafe. 50-50 if you're gonna make it. And their charge was usually one farthing or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker man, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from that era. And there were even a couple famous linker men, famous linker mans, like Lawrence Casey, for example, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Imagine that, your arm must be so strong with that lamp all day. Ooh, it's just like, oh, I can't put it down. Number eight, ghost photography. 1800s ghost photography. Apparently it was a theme or a, a vibe, I don't know, but there are people that would take the photos of these ghosts. So at one point you would be hired as a professional ghost photographer. On paper, here's your tax returns, that's what I did. The camera, of course, was a hot new invention back then, so tales of ghosts and spirit were easily believed, especially when you have a photo of a see-through woman. That probably helps sell your tail for sure. Like, up oh, here she is. It's like, that's that's mom. That's definitely not, you just did that in the back room. That's, I don't believe you. A big name in the ghost game was that of William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849, so now he's for sure a ghost. Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister, and at the age of 22, he was appointed as editor of the Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. Yeah, this British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a spirit. Imagine that, imagine a day where somebody was a awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and they also posed for photo ops with ghosts. Like, can we pick a lane? Science or not? What are we doing here? Number seven, grave designs. Graves, but make them cool, you know? Customize your own pit in the ground. That's fun, that's grim. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, pretty much anything floating around your mouth and eyes, it was spreading and it was bad. Not a good thing to ingest. Not an ideal time in history. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark new fun trend. Yeah, here we go. The safety coffin. Yeah, let's uh, make your own coffin, DIY. These coffins, God forbid, you were buried alive while these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Yeah, some Tony Stark guy in the back's like, if you push this, the body will pop back out and come to life. It's like, really? A lot of these coffins were built with extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire, the safety backup wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground, and attached to a bell on the outside on the ground. So if somebody was walking by and they heard a bell ringing beside a gravestone, first of all, it's haunting, well, they know that something's up and they can get them out. But folks would get creative with their safety coffins. They would ask the inventor to make them crazy things, like a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He had some odd requests. He passed away in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his coffin after he passed. The special door would reveal a layer of glass. Yeah, so if anybody saw any condensation, well, you know, he's still alive and get him out. Only he wasn't alive. And now we just have the world's scariest exhibit, just a real life dead man. Let's close that back up forever. I don't want a glass coffin, that's disgusting. Number six, rat catcher. I mean, obviously you know what's gonna happen with the name the rat catcher. It's gonna make a lot of you out there squirm in your seats and I apologize in advance. Hit that thumbs up, you know, let's even out the energy. Rats in Victorian England, 
they were a massive problem. They were everywhere. Every nook and cranny of your home probably had a dirty, fat rat just sitting there with its weird teeth looking at you. From the basement to the pipes, everywhere. It was literally a, it was a big problem. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So imagine that. So of course, there's a problem. So of course, where there's a problem, there's now a job, right? Someone's got to do something about it. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era. I mean, of course, brave souls. And they were highly praised in society, but the job obviously wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and we'd catch them and you'd often have to kill thousands of rats every single year. And then deal with that. I don't even know how you deal with those bodies. Let's say bones, ew. More often than not, rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats, so. You have your own little animal posse hunting down other animals. You would feel pretty good. You'd feel like a, the king of animals almost. Probably not, eh? It's probably a disgusting job. You probably hate it every day. Number five, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing back in the Victorian era, obviously. I mean, they definitely existed. The first lighter was invented in 1823, but it wasn't like the ones we have now. Not like those Bix that still don't work. It wasn't a portable thing. The first match was invented in 1805, but it kind of sucked. And the first friction activated match came around much later in 18. 1926. This one here changed the game for good. They were made with white phosphorus, which is of course extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was of course done by people, young women. It was only women that had to do this and in the worst of conditions, of course. And before you ask, no, they didn't understand protective gear. Well, they did a bit, but even so, women didn't get that kind of luxury, right? They didn't get that treatment. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would probably end up ingesting said white phosphorus the entire shift. History is horrible. Number four, resurrectionalist. All right, back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of their line, right? You're not gonna go dig up someone's wife and be like, hey, mind if I study her? He's like, no, please. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around to begin with, which led to a good price for bodies that were in, well, reasonably good condition to, you know, study up close, other than being, you know, deceased and disgusting. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, sure, I'll admit that. Now you've probably created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves. And that's exactly what happened. People would become their own resurrectionalist. It's a cool name for a god-awful profession if you want to call it that. The problem was so bad that people had to protect, like they had to guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. Or else these guys would come in and try and dig them up and sell your Nana for like 20 bucks. You have to stay there for four nights and guard her. That's great. No one should have to do that. The Victorian era sucked. No one should have to do that or this next one here. Number three, train engine cleaner. Yeah, this one's gonna suck. It sounds yucky already. For this job, you were required to get into, of course, pretty tough positions to, well, clean the engine of a train. Train engine cleaners would have to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out all that coal that was left over. Yeah, as if shoveling the coal in wasn't bad enough, now some guy's gotta crawl under and shovel it all out. Nope. They go underneath the train with a dusty ash pan and they work away all day long and nights. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains and then spend their nights climbing into the same furnace to clean it out. Every time I watch the Polar Express, it's always so magical, you know, it's always a great time. But even on the Polar Express, there's a guy shoveling coal all night long on Christmas Eve. You know what I mean? That's how bad this job is. Magic can't even save it. Couldn't even picture a worse job to have with this goofy back. Imagine that, imagine me doing this all day. No way, I'm gonna make it one week. Number two, funeral mute. Ah uh, yes, death happened quite a lot back then. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, you know, don't drop them, hmm? all that kind of stuff. Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Now Oliver Twist, one of the lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. All of her twists is like, this one sucks. This one really sucks. Mutes were required to dress, of course, in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would be to, well, to stand and mourn and not say a thing the entire time. You'd have to stand at the door of the recently deceased home and just welcome death. Just embrace it. You have to be death. The mascot for death is now you. Horrible. In Victorian London too, you're gonna breathe in a fresh rotting body. Nice, that's good. I have about four days left, thank you. And after that point, you would lead the coffin all the way to the graveyard, nice and slow, like you're uh, leading a marching band. Only it's not music, it's death behind you. And finally, number one, a chimney sweep. I remember doing this when I was a kid. Okay, I got some questions now. I'm gonna make some phone calls after this list. I had to do this when I was a kid, but back then it was a lot worse. It wasn't a chore, it was an actual job. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young men, guys. I can't say anything else here, but they were young lads. That's it. History is pretty horrible, right? 
you could fill it in. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that made it officially illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. Nice, I was 18 cleaning my chimney at home. I had no idea, I could have busted out this law and been like, actually, three more years, dad. See ya. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the Tichborne case. This was quite a bizarre legal case that captivated Victorian England in the 1860s and 1870s. It involved a claimant named Arthur Orton, who alleged that he was the long lost heir to the Tichborne baronetcy. Despite numerous inconsistencies in his story, Arthur managed to convince some members of the Tichborne family and a significant portion of the public that he was who he claimed to be. The case went to trial in 1873 and it became a media sensation with thousands of people lining up outside the courthouse to catch a glimpse of the proceedings. This was basically like the Victorian era's OJ trial or the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial, you know? The people wanted to know. Despite Arthur's conviction for perjury, the case continued to fascinate the public for years to come and it became a symbol of the era's fascination with sensationalism and fraud. The Tichborne case remains one of the most infamous legal cases in British history and is a cautionary tale about the dangers of believing in something without sufficient evidence. In our number 9 spot today, we have the London Beer Flood. This sounds like it would be quite a fun time, but it was anything but that, and instead it was a tragic event that occurred on October 17th, 1814 in the St. Giles District of London. At the Mew & Company Brewery, a massive vat containing over 135,000 gallons of beer suddenly ruptured, causing a wave of beer to flood the surrounding streets. The the torrent of beer destroyed several nearby houses, killing eight people and injuring many others. The flood was so powerful that it even knocked down the wall of a nearby pub, trapping and killing some of the patrons inside. The London beer flood was caused by a combination of factors, including poor construction of the vat and overfilling it with beer. The brewery had a history of safety concerns and many of the workers were aware of the dangers associated with working there. Despite this, the brewery continued to operate and tragedy struck. The incident became the subject of much media attention at the time, and it continues to be remembered today as a tragic and bizarre event in London's history. The victims of the flood were commemorated with a plaque on the site of the former brewery, and the incident has been the subject of numerous articles, books, and even a stage play. Not sure the logistics of that one though. In our number eight spot today, we have the Victorian bicycle craze. This is a name to refer to a period of intense enthusiasm for bicycles that swept across Europe and North America in the late 19th century. The introduction of the safety bicycle with its chain driven mechanism and rubber tires made cycling a much more accessible activity for the general public. It became a popular mode of transportation and leisure activity, particularly among the middle and upper classes. The craze also had a significant impact on fashion, with women's clothing becoming more practical and comfortable to allow for cycling. It's funny to think of now because like, it's just a bike, but at the time it was so much more than that. It's like how smartphones completely changed our lives in more ways than we probably even know. That's basically what the bike was like in the Victorian era. The bicycle craze had a profound impact on society and culture at the time. It led to the development of new industries, such as cycling clubs, and it also paved the way for the modern transportation industry. The bicycle became a symbol of freedom and empowerment, particularly for women who were able to travel further and faster than ever before. The Victorian bicycle craze remains an important cultural and historical phenomenon that changed the way people lived, worked, and played. In our number seven spot today, we have the Crimean War. The Crimean War was a conflict fought between 1853 and 1856, primarily involving Russia and an alliance of France, Britain, the Ottoman Empire, and Sardinia. The war was fought over various territorial and religious disputes, particularly regarding the rights of Christians in the Ottoman Empire. The war was marked by high casualties, particularly from disease and poor medical care, and it is often seen as a turning point in military medicine. The war also featured some of the first extensive use of modern technologies such as telegraphs and railways which greatly impacted warfare in the future. The war ended in a victory for the allied forces and it resulted in a significant shakeup of the balance of power in Europe. It also demonstrated the need for improved communication, organization, and medical care in military conflicts and it had significant long-term impacts on military and political strategies in Europe 
and beyond. In our number six spot today, we have the East End Outbreak. The East End Outbreak was an outbreak of cholera in 1866 and was a major epidemic that struck the densely populated area of East London, causing widespread illness and death. Cholera is a highly contagious disease that spreads through contaminated water, and in the Victorian era, London's water supply was notoriously unsanitary. The outbreak was particularly devastating in the East End, where poverty and overcrowding made residents more vulnerable to disease. The outbreak led to significant changes in public health policy and infrastructure, as well as increased public awareness of the importance of sanitation and hygiene. The physician Jon Snow, which, you know, feels like a weird name to say when I'm not talking about Game of Thrones, but the physician Jon Snow played a key role in identifying the source of the outbreak, tracing it to a contaminated water pump on Broad Street. His work really paved the way for the development of modern epidemiology and disease prevention. The the East End cholera outbreak remains a significant event in the history of public health and the struggle for social justice. It brought attention to the urgent need for clean water and adequate sanitation, and it helped to spur reforms that improved the health and well-being of people in urban areas. In our number 5 spot today, we have the London Burkers. This is the name used to refer to a notorious of body snatchers who operated in London in the early 19th century. They were involved in the illegal trade of selling corpses to medical schools for dissection and study, and they would often resort to killings to obtain the bodies. The most infamous member of the gang was William Burke, who, along with his partner William Hare, committed a series of killings in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1828. They sold the corpses to the anatomist Robert Knox, who was unaware of their methods. Two of the group's members, John Bishop and Thomas Miss Williams were convicted of killings and sentenced to death. The London Burger scandal highlighted the demand for fresh corpses for medical research and contributed to the passage of the Anatomy Act of 1832, which allowed for the legal procurement of corpses for medical purposes. Emphasis on the legal part of that, though. Important. In our number four spot today, we have the Great Stink of London. The Great Stink of London was an environmental disaster that occurred in the summer of 1858. It was caused by the city's inadequate sewage system, which allowed raw sewage and waste to be dumped directly into the River Thames. The hot weather only exacerbated the problem, which is disgusting, and it caused the sewage to ferment and emit a foul odor that permeated the city. The smell was so overwhelming that it caused widespread illness and forced many people to flee the city. Parliament was forced to act, and a major engineering project was launched to build a modern sewage system for London. This project was led by engineer Joseph Bazalget, who designed a system of sewers and pumping stations that would carry sewage out of the city and into the Thames estuary. The construction of the new sewage system was a massive undertaking, involving the excavation of miles of tunnels and the construction of large pumping stations. It took several years to complete, but once it was finished, it greatly improved the health and hygiene of the city. The Great Stink was a turning point in the history of public health, and it helped to spur major improvements in sanitation and public health infrastructure across the developed world. Today, the legacy of the Great Stink lives on in the modern sewer systems and wastewater treatment facilities that are really essential for maintaining public health and environmental quality. In our number three spot today, we have Typhoid Mary. The Typhoid Mary case is a famous incident in the history of public health in the United States. States. Mary Mallon, also known as Typhoid Mary, was an asymptomatic carrier of the bacteria that causes typhoid fever, a potentially fatal disease. Despite being unaware of her condition, Mary inadvertently infected numerous people during her work as a cook in New York City in the early 1900s. After a number of typhoid outbreaks were traced back to Mary's cooking, she was tracked down and forcibly quarantined for several years. The case generated significant controversy at the time, with some arguing that Mary Mary's civil rights had been violated, and others maintaining that public safety justified her isolation. The Typhoid Mary case remains significant for its implications for public health policy and for the balance between individual rights and public safety. In our number two spot today, we have the Birmingham Riots. These riots took place in 1839, and they were a series of violent clashes that occurred in the city of Birmingham, England. The riots were sparked by tensions between two groups, the Chartists, who were calling for political reform and greater democratic representation and the authorities who opposed the movement. On July 4th, 1839, a group of Chartists held a rally in Birmingham's Bull Ring where they were met with opposition from local government agencies. The situation quickly escalated into violence with protesters and authorities engaging in brutal clashes that lasted for several days. The Birmingham riots
Chartists of 1839 were significant for their role in the history of the Chartist movement, and it is said that the events of 1839 demonstrated the lengths to which authorities were willing to go to suppress the movement. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Brown Dog Affair. This was a controversy that arose in the early 20th century in London over the use of animals in medical research. In 1903, a statue of a brown dog was erected in Battersea, which had been used in vivisection experiments by a scientist named William Bayless. If you're unfamiliar, vivisection is defined as, quote, the practice of performing operations on live animals for the purpose of experimentation or scientific research. While I am all for the advancement of science, I do believe in ethical studies, and this clearly was not that. The statue was intended as a memorial to the countless animals that had been used in medical research, but it was met with outrage from some people. Anti-vivisection groups saw it as a symbol of animal cruelty, while some medical researchers saw it as an attack on their work. In 1907, a group of medical students attacked the statue during a protest, sparking a violent confrontation with anti-vivisection activists. The statue was eventually removed by authorities, but the controversy continued to rage on for many years. The Brown Dog Affair highlighted the deep divisions in society over the use of animals in medical research and contributed to the development of new laws and regulations aimed at protecting animal welfare. Number 10, Jack the Ripper. If we were to pick a poster boy for this list, well, it'd be him. Jack the Ripper was the alias given to the unknown criminal with sick tastes. During a period in the late 1800s, there was a string of cold-blooded delifings that affected London, Victorian London to be specific. It got so bad that they were telling people not to go out at night in fear of the Ripper. Ooh, that does not sound good. His crimes were extremely graphic and violent and meant for a much more mature and suitable audience. Just to make things even worse, he was never caught or really even fully identified. Some of the theories say he was a she, he was multiple people, or even Prince Albert. They thought it was Prince Albert at one point. They, they really don't know. Oh, that's terrible. That's just awful. Right, I'll go out with you, but your ripper could be out. Number nine, Charles Bravo. Mr. Bravo succumbed to his illness in 1876. He had been poisoned with atimony, which at first when I read that, I thought it said alimony, and I feel like a lot of husbands died of that. That's a divorce joke for everybody at home. With atimony, which is a poison that works very, very slowly. Slowly enough that he would have known what was happening. Thus, he quite possibly knew who did it, but never never revealed who did. Now, at the time, it was believed to be a manual checkout, if you will. What's crazy about this case, though, is that it's like a game of Clue. The wife was having an affair with a doctor, so, you know, there was something there. There was also a disgruntled maid who all wanted a piece of Mr. Bravo. Mm, yes. The family fun game night conclusion was it was the wife in the library with the candlestick. I meant the poison. She poisoned him. It, it, it was her with the poison. I th we think. That's the running theory. We still don't know. Number eight, Thames Torso. The Thames River is famous for being a stinky, rotten, no good, very bad river filled with the most heinous refuse humans have to offer. That's right, love. It's awful, isn't it? Oh, it's bloody awful. So, to some um, it shouldn't be a surprise that in September of 1873, a woman's torso was recovered from the river. Hold on to your barf bag, folks, because it's only going to get worse from here. There was also lungs, a right thigh, a right shoulder, and lastly, a scalp of the face. And, and, and it was attached. It was gross. Ooh, they found that as well. Authorities did their best to reconstruct the body, but uh, this isn't a Malibu plastic surgery office. They even sat out the face on display in hopes the public could identify the victim. One man suspected it was his missing daughter, but a positive ID could not be made. Thus, we know nothing about the case. Number seven, the Gattins. In 1898, adult siblings Michael, Nora, and Ellen Murphy were on their way home Boxing Day after an entertaining day out. They made their way home after a dance had been canceled. And sometimes it happens, but they still made the best of it. And you know what? I respect that. Enjoy your life. Enjoy the afternoon. That's awesome. However, they never made it home. Their bodies were discovered in a grisly, bloody scene. I mean, really bad. Skulls were crushed, bodies were beaten, and someone had done in the horse. I mean, they, they shot the horse, that's crazy. No witnesses, I guess. To this day, nobody knows what happened to the siblings. It's really scary. <laughs> Number six, Edwin Bartlett. Edwin Bartlett, like many other people in the Victorian era, was in need of a good dentist. I can use one too. I need braces. I need braces. I'll be, be so cute with braces. A lack of dental hygiene made for many issues back then. So 
If you take away anything from this list today, folks, it's brush your teeth and go see your dentist. It's important. Well, he went to the dentist because his breath had been so bad, he had to sleep in separate beds from his wife. He had so, he had so much buildup and gunk in there. It was that bad. Gross. For me, it's because I farted in my sleep, or at least so I'm told. That's what everyone says. I don't know. At the time, Mrs. Bartlett asked her husband to pick up a large portion of chloroform because that was legal back then. You just... Pick up some chloroform. Okay, sure. What a time to be alive. He later was found with chloroform in his system. A large amount. The missus somehow convinced the court that she was innocent. A study done almost 100 years later confirmed it was her. Well, at least maybe it was her. We're, again, still not sure because it was so long ago. Number five, Harriet Boozwell. Christmas morning, 1872 was a good morning for everyone waking up except Harriet Boozwell, who was found carved up like a Christmas goose. Oh God. The night before she had attended a fancy Christmas ball as you do back then. And she was seen leaving with a well-dressed handsome man, a foreigner, most likely German as witnesses report. She was found the next day with multiple lacerations and uh, yeah, it wasn't pretty. The police eventually followed a trail of evidence to a German man in South America. But because of the man's pleasant demeanor and solid alibi, he was dropped as a suspect, even though his maid claims of cleaning a bloody handkerchief that night of her passing. No one else was ever arrested for the crime, and that was the end of that one. Oh, yeah, the bloody handkerchief, yes, yeah, that was, um, that was my brother. I had nothing to do with that. Yeah, it was not me, sorry. Number four, Elizabeth Jackson. Surprise, surprise, another mangled corpse was found in the River Thames. Hmm, that's weird. This time, the lower half of a woman and legs. As the days went on, more and more parts were discovered, and after another bad glue and paste project, it was identified to be Elizabeth Jackson, a young woman who had left her home in shame of an unwedded pregnancy. Ooh, scandalous. Sadly, she ended up in River Thames and no one is sure who did it at all. Some claim actually it was Jack the Ripper and while it does make sense, experts don't all agree. Thus, it is another unsolved mystery. God, that's, why is it happening so much back then? What the hell's going on? God. Number three, Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden took an ax and gave her mother 40 wax and when she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. That's a, that's a nice nurse. What a nice thing to say about a, ni a nice young lady. Maybe one of the most famous crimes ever, actually. In a nutshell, it looked like Lizzie had done it. It was a it was a closed and shut case. It seemed like a pretty concrete open and shut case. But yet again, somehow, she got off free. She claimed that she was in the barn when it happened, and then she discovered the bodies. Now, most of the topics on this list are a whodunit, but I mean, for sure this one, we, we can't be so serious to not ignore the facts here, right? I mean, she was the only person there who, who could have done it. Oh, well, unsolved apparently. Oh God, all right, she didn't do it. Number two, the West Ham vanishings. Just east of London between the years of 1882 and 1899, a few women disappeared and they were left in parks, or at least their bodies were. I don't know why that keeps happening. It's just, it's, 1800s is weird. And while we don't know very much about Jack the Ripper, we know even less about these cases as they've somewhat fallen into obscurity. Naturally, police thought it could be Jack the Ripper again, but it's also likely that it's not. I'm starting to think Victoria and London isn't the safest place for a lady to be. I'm, I don't like this is going. That's all the information on that one. It was like, yeah, they're, they died. We don't know who did it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'll put that in. Number one, Carrie Brown. This one takes place in 1881 Manhattan. Carrie Brown was found deceased in a hotel room. A man named Amir Abi was arrested and spent 11 years in jail for the crime before being proven innocent and released. So what's so crazy about this whole thing? Well, given the same style, the running theory was that again, this was Jack the Ripper even though this was New York and not London. So the question is really, who did carry in? And if it was Jack the Ripper, why is he in New York? And how many more did he really commit in London and New York? Man, that's scary, dude. I don't know. Let's start off with a title that describes the Victorians in of itself. Melodrama. The Victorian era culture wasn't actually the whole fair ye black death blah blah vibe entirely. It was more like the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes movies where it's dark and gritty and the people are obsessed with death and corruption of religion and occult stuff. The word melodrama, literally meaning music drama or song drama, derives from Greek but reached the Victorian theater by way of the French who had adopted the interest during the revolutionary period. In Britain, melodrama 
melodrama became the most popular kind of theatrical entertainment for most of the 18th and 19th century, a period where more people went out to the theatre than any other time in history. Melodrama's unprecedented popularity during the Victorian period owes its life to the diverse audience it could draw, working class to aristocratic, but it also the illegitimate theatres that had been forbidden by law to perform drama involving spoken word. Many melodramas were book renditions or artisanal written and often featuring gore or death, and remained popular until the end of the 19th century. Looking for a less noisy affair, more somewhere to chat but also be entertained, why how about the music halls? Even more popular for their variety of singing, contortionists, illusionists, animal tamers, trick cyclists, ballet girls, and more! These emerged in the 1850s and by the 1870s there were hundreds across Britain. The audiences chatted throughout the acts and they could be unruly, throwing things at performers like bottles, old boots, vegetables, and even dead cats. In some halls, bottles carried by waiters were chained to the trays, and the orchestra was protected from flying objects by steel grills. While women initially weren't allowed in the middle class song and supper rooms, they were later encouraged to attend because people hoped that they would have a civilizing influence on the men. Who, who thought that? That's not why women wanted to go. Anywho, throughout the 1860s, it became more common for women to perform in music halls themselves. Many married into aristocracy because of it, got hired onto big performers and went touring, or ended up modeling for magazines. Through topical songs, music halls played the political edge and kept their audiences informed and educated about their rights and about the current social, economic, and political issues or corruptions. The last two decades of the 19th century saw steady efforts to control and regulate music halls, with music regulation, performer regulation, enforcement measures to reduce alcohol in worker and worker girls, and slowly introducing higher paying audience. And since I mentioned alcohol, the Victorian era was one of mixology. Many of the cocktails we drink now we owe to the British advent, and mixology historians consider the time of the mid 1800s to prohibition to be the golden age of mixology. Cocktail bars today use recipes and techniques that derive or replicate what the Victorians used in mix. The term cocktail began to be used in the very late 1700s, with the first workable definition printed in 1806. The popular mixed drinks of the time were punches and warm spice drinks served in large quantities rather than individually prepared drinks. Industrialization and changing societal norms came the rise of the cocktail because more available ingredients, the availability of ice, and the societal change seeing men and women working class aristocratic socializing together in public. So emerged career bartenders. One of the first people to make a name for himself was the hotshot bartender Jerry Thomas. He's so responsible for creating the trend he's considered the father of American mixology. In fact, there was a gin craze of the 18th century and it highlights the Brits love of cocktails. The consumption of gin in Great Britain, especially London, was so high Parliament passed five major acts in 1729, 36, 43, 47, and 51 designed to control the consumption of gin. Whether at home, the music halls, or the dirty smoggy streets, the Brits loved a good novel. Print culture in Victorian era was diverse, aided by relatively high literacy rates. There were hundreds of magazines and newspapers available at cheaper prices, so even the most lowly and humble could enjoy some writing, even if it was subpar entry level crap. The 1880s saw the emergence of the new journalism, which drew in readers with pieces of violent crimes and scandals in high society, aka the true crime podcast of the times. Then novels were a key feature of the Victorian print culture. By mid-century, Britons of all classes could afford and read novels. Some were aimed at the highly educated and well-off people, others at less educated readers looking for appealing and exciting stories. Penny dreadfuls and sensation novels seen at their best in the work of Wilkie Collins thrilled their readers, and Victorian novels were often long with complicated plots and many characters. Many of those by Charles Dickens are still read today, and the Penny Dreadfuls made it to the TV screen in the masterful three season TV drama. You guys should check it out. And where better to read my newest Mary Shelley horror than my bestest painted office filled with taxidermy? The Georgian era was one of rationalism, but a shift in ideology took place as this period transitioned into the Victorians. Their view aligned more so with the Romantics, who were intrigued with by mysticism and death. So while they were a time of technological advancement and progress, culturally Victorians were prone to bizarre habits and beliefs. Like when a human family member passed away, Victorians did an extensive mourning ceremony, like take pictures with the dead, sometimes wear black for years, sob and roll on the ground. So when a family pet passed away, it's not that much different, and it's common to hire a taxidermist to preserve the animal, giving them a second life, which reflects the Victorian belief that animals should be useful to humans even in death. Walter Potter was a celebrated celebrity English taxidermist, known for his dioramas of animals mimicking real life situations. Also famously known for not being an 
who killed his animals to create art, but rather receiving donations from local farmers to do so. In 1861, Potter opened his own museum to showcase his creations, and it remained popular until the early 19th century when people began raising questions about how ethical taxidermy was. Victorians actually liked to collect weird stuff so much they made curiosity cabinets. Victorians were curious people with an interest in nature, the sciences, anatomy, botany, and morbidity. And for the upper class citizens, collecting scientific objects showed they were sophisticated and educated, often displaying their collections in a curiosity cabinet. These German cabinets were a way for the wealthy to show off their hobby. Oftentimes, beautiful wooden display cases with elaborate carvings and glass fronts, or a larger, narrow, open shelving style bookcase. Curiosity cabinets were usually kept in places where guests could see them to stir conversations about the pieces. And collecting was a social activity that allowed you to share your interests and also show off what you knew in a humble manner. Many curiosity cabinets were eclectic, filled to the brim with unrelated mixed oddities. Although most collectors were not formally trained, this never deterred anyone and even working class people started collecting items like buttons, fetishes, pocket sized portraits, stones and animal bones. Death, insect and human oddity photographs were as popular as Pokemon. Even oddity performers made business cards called carte de viste, a small photograph card collectible of themselves. Joseph Merrick, a professional showman known as the Elephant Man, was a popular carte de viste. And he worked for the next topic on the list, the freak shows. It was a weirdly massive part of the Victorian culture, described as a family friendly commercial event. They were the entertainment pinnacle. The name itself is offensive and many Victorians even then boycotted the shows for its mockery and ableism. But the shows acted as a source of solace for performers that were often disabled or had genetic differences that made them potentially rejectable from society and potentially their own families. In the Victorian era, asylums were hellish and if that was your option or a job in the circus, many made the choice to live in a welcoming community of similarly ostracized people with differences. Siamese twins, extra limbs, excessive hair growth, malformation, and many married and had children and functioning lives of normalcy despite making a living performing for audiences as freaks. Their stories embody the magnificent resiliency of human spirit and they make a killing off the lustuous need for weirdness in the Victorian era, emptying wallets of people who wouldn't accept them outside of a show ring and living more financially secure than they did. The show started in the 1500s but hit their boom in the 1800s and the best performers were often found in Queen Victoria's own court. Some famous names were Millie and Christine McCoy, John Merrick, Fanny Mills, Prince Ron and Ella Harper. Next up is how Victorian oddity obsession literally irreparably destroyed a ton of history. Egyptomania. It began in 1798 with the launch of Napoleon's campaigns in Egypt and Syria, a fitting example of imperialism when they find the Rosetta Stone. Europe goes on a mission to proliferate and appropriate any and all Egyptian antiquity or aesthetic culture vulture style. The Egyptian obsession consumed Western thought, revealing itself through their literature, art, and culture at the time. This includes Included their mummy unwrapping parties and novels such as Arthur Conan Doyle's Lot 249, and also their decor. Anyone who could afford to travel to Egypt could realistically afford to buy a mummy because they kind of sold them at bazaars like Barbies at Walmart. When it came to mummy unwrapping parties, Victorians let their intrigue cloud their, let's see, judgment, human decency, morals, conscience. Man, am I missing anything? It was a form of entertainment that was a complete desecration of Egypt, its people, and their ancestors. Thomas Pettigrew, who was a surgeon, antiquary, and an author was a well-known unroller at one notable gathering for the unwrapping of Neshkins. The second wife of Thebian high priest Pio Jem II was placed in a contraption that made her appear to dance. The demand for mummies to take home was so high that Egyptians even started transporting them from less visited ruins to areas that got more traffic. Hundreds are now lost, as are their tomb locations. These gatherings thankfully died out in the later years of the 19th century, not because Victorians realized their inhumanity, but because of boredom. Because the Victorians were greedy, nothing filled their interest for very long, except occult and spiritualism. They put that bleep in everything. Books, newspapers, clothes, art, decor, parties. The modern spiritualism movement was generally agreed to start on April 1st of 1848 in Hydesville, New York, when teen sisters claimed to speak to a ghost of a man killed in their home. News that spread worldwide and that had a complete fascination chokehold on England, causing the spiritualism movement of the 1860s and attracting people from different social classes, including Queen Victoria. The most popular forms of occult interest in the late Victorian period include mesmerism, clairvoyance, electrobiology, crystal gazing, specialty newspapers, public seances, thought reading, and above all else, 
Conjuring. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, like many late Victorians, was fascinated by the possibility of communication with the departed souls. The core belief of their spiritualism movement was that the living could communicate with the dead through the help of a medium endowed with the supernatural gift during the mysterious and entertaining seance phenomena or performance. Charlatans will always take advantage after all. Within the late Victorian counterculture of spiritualism, a number of women and men gained fame and authority as skilled mediums. And now for the original garden gnome, the dirty old man in the backyard. See this? This is a gnome. If you're a basic B word, you might consider just tossing one of these among your flowers and calling it a day. No, you want this. See this? This is the dirty old dude that you would hire to live menacingly in your backyard. Why? I don't I don't know. Why not? I I don't have an answer for you. So yeah, uh, in the Victorian era, 18th century, wealthy families hired people to don full hermit garb, complete with robes, long hair, beards, and as Campbell cites from an advertisement in 1797, Hermit is never to leave of the place or hold a conversation with anyone for seven years during which he's neither to wash himself or cleanse himself in any way whatever, but is to let his hair and nails on both hands and feet grow as long as nature will permit them. These hired hermits would then lodge in shacks, caves, and other hermitages constructed on the homeowner's property, a rustic fairy tale manor or a creepy, I don't really know. It was a practice mostly found in England, although it made it up to Scotland and over to Ireland as well. But it originates in Rome. Emperor Hadrian had one of these at his villa in Tivoli as a thinking lodge, as did Pope Pius III. From there, it gradually verged away from religious devotees seeking isolation for themselves for spiritual reflection to a stinky dude lodging for an 18th century profession. It might seem like a whimsical garden feature, but it was all about that most celebrated Georgian England emotion, melancholy. Introspection and somberness of spirit were prized amongst the elite, and rules that they asked the hermits to play embodied this because they weren't able to do it themselves. The ornamental hermit vanished at the end of the 18th century to be replaced by these ugly little monstrosities. So go stomp on a gnome today, everyone. Number 10. No calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7 Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally, because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Pfft. Call on a man? No way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm getting a little lonely. Number 9. Act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Ugh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Ugh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture, as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare a woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind? Oh, the nerve! That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number 8. Charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was. Especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't going to happen. They, they just weren't going to be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel. Or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone, because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, 
That's just not very groovy, baby. Yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together, but given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women. Like, 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow-up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five. Big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me. And it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no. Commonly called self-pollution. Which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his carrot or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just, as long as the bedroom door's closed, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything, and if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second-rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it, because with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did, and I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? 
That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number 2. A Healthy Breakfast Ok, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self pollution was a big no no and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad. So a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self love. What if a man had a delicious nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Corn flakes. By Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge. Yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works. I mean, go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, I'm not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching. So sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it, uh, had their toes curled. Reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it. From that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms, but that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Cause science. Number 10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era. And who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more. We need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible. Because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time. Because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number 8. The Products of Our Sins Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling? Yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number 7. Diet Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number 9 and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. 
So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over in the corner looks pretty lonely. And Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend, oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night. Number five, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally it flourished, especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so. Uh... Number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial on a liver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victorian London or maybe some b-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias, some say it was Prince Albert, there's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least, and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there ladies, just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old blightier self may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic, that's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that the next time, Bly, I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. 
If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror. The absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? I, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. At number 10, death photography. Has anyone out there looked at really old photos and had that eerie thought that everyone in that photo is dead now? I have. I know it sounds kind of weird, but it's just something that comes to mind sometimes. Back in the Victorian era though, they really had that thought because death photography became a trend at the time. Back then, people were dropping like flies. They dealt with a lot of illnesses like measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, rubella, typhus, and cholera. Death was all around them, but with the rise of photography, this became a new way of keeping a memento of their loved one who passed away. Before this, they would keep locks of hair and other items from their loved ones, but once they got access to cameras, families started posing with their dead relatives. Literally. Families would often keep the bodies of their dead loved one in the house for days after their passing in order to have that mourning period, but soon they started staging photo shoots with the remains of their relatives, posing them and dressing them up to make it look like they're still alive. Family members would take pictures with the deceased to have one last family portrait before burying their loved one. It's kind of heartwarming in a way, but also really creepy. At number 9, Emigration. During the Victorian era, there was unfortunately a lot of orphan children living in the streets of London. It became a pretty big problem because of the sheer amount of young people without homes or families. It was estimated that around 30,000 children were living on the streets in London in 1869. Soon a program was put into place to try and solve this issue and people started rounding up these orphan kids and shipping them off elsewhere to work in some of the British colonies. Many of the kids who were shipped off ended up working as farmhands or as domestic servants. Though many children were shipped off to places like New Zealand and Australia, the majority of them went to Canada. About 80,000 of them actually. They were sent away with hopes that they would be able to live better lives, but unfortunately for many of those kids, they didn't end up having any better luck in compared to when they lived on the streets. This practice ended up becoming pretty controversial as you can imagine. Before we carry on talking about the strange things that happened in the Victorian era, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mental Health. Back in the Victorian era, the study of the human brain and psyche was still relatively new, so no one really knew what was going on up in people's noggins. Mental asylums started to pop up and people started getting diagnosed with mental problems even if the diagnosis wasn't accurate. The three labels that a patient could fall under were the manic, the melancholic, and those with dementia. The symptoms for those big three labels often varied, and people were admitted to asylums for some pretty messed up reasons. There was a list of common causes for mental illness that people referred to back then, and it included things like, quote, laziness, novel reading, superstition, an immoral life, and intemperance, as well as the act of self-pleasuring. For women, they could also be sent to asylums for some pretty ridiculous reasons, like imaginary female trouble, hysteria, rumor of husband murder, and even fits of desertion of husband. I am so glad things have changed since then. At number 7, Grave Robber. When you think of jobs back in the Victorian era, you might think of things like chimney sweeps and lawyers. But another relatively popular though questionable profession was being a grave robber. Yes, people actually made a living off robbing graves. As people studied medicine, they needed cadavers to practice on, but there was a law saying that only the bodies of those who had been executed for a crime could be used as a cadaver, and since the laws changed to include less and less crimes having death penalties, soon people started running out of cadavers to practice on, and this gave way to the boom in the grave robbing industry. People can make a pretty penny for snatching bodies from cemeteries and selling them to medical professionals and students. Fresher bodies went for more money, and the grave robbers not only made money off the sale of the cadaver, but they also charged a fee, so they ended up with a little extra cash in their pockets. Eventually, the grave robbing business became such a big problem that cemeteries started installing watchtowers and guards to prevent people from getting away with the dead. At number 6, Beauty. I've talked about this before in some past videos, but the Victorian era was 
famous for its strange beauty practices, so I just had to include it on this list. You're probably familiar with the makeup from the Victorian era. Women often painted their faces white to look as pale as possible, but even though they believed it made them look beautiful, it also did a lot of harm to their health. The white face paint that women would use was lead based, and as we all by now, lead makes you dead. But this white lead paint isn't the only thing that harms people's skin. Women would also wash their faces with ammonia to make their skin look paler. At night, women would rub opium on their faces, and if they were really dedicated to their beauty regime, they would also ingest arsenic. They were literally poisoning themselves in the name of beauty. Women would also use mercury on their eyebrows and eyelashes and would use lemon juice or belladonna in their eyes, which could cause blindness in some people. Once again, I'm glad things have changed. At number five, no divorce. Nowadays, divorce is quite common. All you have to do is sign a paper and you're done. But back in the Victorian era, before the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857 allowed divorce, people had to find different ways of getting rid of their spouses. After all, just because there was no divorce doesn't mean that everyone was happy in their marriages. It turns out that in order to solve their problems and get rid of their spouse, people would just sell their wives, either in public or in private sales. Most of the time, a man would take his wife to the town square and just sell her off to a new man. According to to some records, some women had the power to veto a sale, and sometimes it was for cash. Though I think the cheapest that a wife was ever sold for was a pint of beer. This wasn't necessarily bad for the woman, because if she was sold to someone else, things could sometimes work out and she could live a better life with a better spouse. And if she didn't, then she would just get sold again and get to try her luck with a new man. At number 4, food additives. These days, people are becoming more and more concerned with artificial additives in their food. All natural, organic, pesticide and hormone free food is becoming more and more popular, but back in the Victorian era, people were putting all kinds of additives in their noms, and a lot of it was really, really bad for you. Like, we're talking deadly. Chalk and alum were often added to bread dough to make it whiter, and sometimes pipe clay, plaster of Paris, or sawdust was added to the mix as well. Red lead was sometimes added to cheese, lead was added to cider, mustard, wine, sugars, and candies, copper sulfates were used in preserving fruits, jams, and wine, mercury was used in candies, and even ice cream was made using a water and chalk mixture. All of these unsafe ingredients are actually what prompted the food safety industry because no matter what's going on, you shouldn't be eating lead, chalk, and mercury. At number three, corpse medicine. Now earlier I mentioned the whole grave robber industry and how that really took off during the Victorian era, but now let's talk about how they used corpses in their medicine. Back then, some people believed that consuming certain parts of the human body could cure their ailments. I know. Gross, right? One of the more popular medicines back then was a mixture made with human skull and chocolate, and it was believed to cure apoplexy. Back in the Victorian era, medical texts were published describing what parts of the human body could be used to treat specific ailments. One text described mixing the skull of a young woman with treacle to treat epilepsy. Another text says that you could treat paralysis with a candle made of human fat. Apparently, executioners were linked to this type of medicine as they would, you know, execute someone and then use the remains to become a doctor and treat people's illnesses. Imagine Grey's Anatomy, but with Victorian medicine. Sounds like an interesting thing to watch, but also probably not to experience. At number two, mummies. Speaking of dead people though, people from the Victorian era were oddly fascinated with mummies. I mean, I can understand the fascination to a certain extent because they're old and cool, but of course, these people just had to be extra weird and take that obsession with mummies to heights that they didn't need to be. People used ground up mummies to make paint, Pieces of mummies were sold in jars, and they were even used in advertising. One candy shop put a mummy on display in the store, claiming that it was the daughter of a pharaoh who saved baby Moses. I mean, that's weird, right? I understand that this was all happening as archaeologists were starting to uncover lost treasures and secrets from Egypt, but I mean, a mummy in a candy shop? Seems a little much. And finally at number one, baby farmers. Now for what I believe is probably the most disturbing thing from the Victorian era, baby farmers. Basically, this was an industry of women who would take unwanted babies and either take care of them, give them to new parents, or unfortunately have them disposed of. One famous case of the darker side of baby farmers comes from a woman named Amelia Dyer. She was known to have charged women a lot of money to take their babies off their hands, but unfortunately the children wouldn't survive Amelia's care. It is believed that Amelia was responsible for the passings of hundreds of babies, making her one of the biggest monsters of the Victorian era. Now before we 
wrap things up for today. I want you guys to leave a comment down below telling me if you would ever want to take a trip back in time to visit the Victorian era. And if so, what's one thing that you wish you could see? Leave me your thoughts down in the comments. Number 10, the hobble skirt. This is a bad idea written all over it. The hobble skirt, also jokingly called the speed limit skirt, was a dress with a very tight hem, making the poor lass who's wearing its movement, well, not having much of it. Can't have the wife running off from her home now, <laughs> even if that, you know, that meant the home was not a good place and men acted really bad back then. But no, you can't have her running away. Apparently though, some were so tight that it caused women to fall. And in some extreme cases, I, I can't believe this, those falls were fatal. What? Number nine, muslin dresses. Honestly, I can see celebrities doing this today. Okay, so the female figure. It's sleek, it's curvy, it's gorgeous. Today a girl's got some options on how she wants to flaunt what her mama gave her. You go girls. But back then, well, not, not so much. Except for the muslin dress apparently, which I find strange at the time since seeing a woman's ankle could give a guy a stiff neck for hours, if you catch my drift. Essentially this was a dress that you had to wet first, like a, a gentle misting if you will. Yeah, weird right? And then you'd wear it out. Now for the summertime, this makes sense, and honestly, I might support this myself actually. See the curves, stay cool, however some stories tell us of women who wore this during cooler weather and then got sick. Fashion over function ladies, be careful, that's a silly one. Oh, 40 below, I better wear my muslin dress, yes, I'm just gonna walk out. <laughs> Number 8, ladies wear. Okay, this is a general one, but ladies' dresses and wear in general was just ridiculous. I mean, I mean those big poofy dresses, it just seems like ladies had it rough. When have they not? Wear a dress that's too tight or so big you struggle to walk around. Not to mention the fancies of dresses have wire, wood cages, and frames. Just making walking around more difficult because, yeah, that makes sense. For me, anytime I wear formal wear, I keep an eye out for bathrooms. You never know when you need to go. However, I just can't imagine trying to squeeze the lemon in those bad boys. Whew, that would be difficult. To make matters worse, there are stories of women wearing just regular big poopy dresses and then getting in accidents at factories. And yes, it was gruesome. And yes, they didn't make it out. And no, there's no movies about it. Stop asking. Number seven, pestilence fabrics. Last time I was talking about the Victorian era, I mentioned a few points on fabrics with harmful and dangerous chemicals, which happened more than it should have. It shouldn't happen at all, really. It's kind of sad. Well, that wasn't the only fabric related issue that was out to get you back then. For example, wealthy people couldn't be bothered to do their own laundry. I hate doing laundry, I don't blame you. I'm not wealthy though. And sometimes would have them washed and taken away by launders who, well, wash clothes to the rest of the city. Being that clothes and washers themselves were poor, or that clothes were just mixed around regardless, well, that was an issue. There was a lot of sickness going around at the time, and, well, it was contagious. A lot of times, these sicknesses would cling to fabrics, and when given back to their customers, well, they could very well come down whatever London was feeling at the time. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun. I, I, I think I'll just wear more of my dirty stuff. I'll just wear my underwear for six months straight. It was white when I bought it, not anymore, but it's okay. Number six, lead. Here we go again. Lead, just lead in general. It was used in so much stuff. Seriously, it, it, it's scary. Especially because they knew it was harmful. It wasn't a secret, they knew. Uh, I was gonna pick one leaded item, but I, I mean, I couldn't. I mean, seriously, I know this is a list about fashion, but it was involved in some clothes making processes, it was, it was in women's makeup, which that's also fashion, and it was in house paint, which I know that's not technically fashion, but it kinda is. Trust me, I used to mix paint before I was an internet comedian. I know the history of paint. Ask me your paint related questions in the comments below. I'm the guy you need to talk to. I mean, it was used in pipes too, and we drank out of those, it's just crazy. Now, it is one of those things that minor exposure to is fine, sure, but the thing was with fashion and beauty is that you probably would use said product every day, like the clothing or the makeup, and especially the makeup of the ladies. Lead poisoning symptoms include headaches, stomach pain, constipation, infertility, and memory loss. Yikes, that's not fun. We don't like that here. Number five, corsets. Nobody wants a waist bigger than nine inches, said everybody in Victorian times. I for one can appreciate the female form and the hourglass figure. It's admirable, sure, but that being said, I, I don't think we need to go so far to keep the female form in shape. The corset's a little too much. 
corsets were those chest tightening, gut sunking, push all to mince meat to the top of the pie apparel that went under every woman's dress or every fat dude in his 50s who wants to feel 29 again. I don't think I have to tell you why this is bad or uncomfortable. The human chest needs to breathe, and when something's that tight around you, well, you struggle to breathe. Uh, trouble breathing, fainting were not all too rare, especially in hot and humid climates. For my generation, you may recall Elizabeth Swan had issue with hers and Pirates of the Caribbean. And then she fell, and then Jack Sparrow caught her, and it was a good movie. But don't, the corsets, I just I can't get behind them. Number four, foot binding. While not exclusively done in the Victorian era, it was started in ancient times and continued all the way up until the 20th century, thus includes the Victorian era. A Chinese fashion tradition that takes women's feet and binds them and squeezes them until they begin to change shape. Oh, poor ladies. Again, I don't think I need to tell you that forcibly changing bone and muscle structure in your feet just for fashion is a bad idea. I think you all know that. For starters, it doesn't look right. After years of binding, the shape of the foot drastically changes. Secondly, the health risk of doing such is not worth it. Oftentimes, toenails fall off or become infected. Ugh, gross. Bones break and pierce skin. It's a bad time all around. Thank God we stopped doing that, right? Jeez. Oh, thanks. Number three, lard wigs. Wigs have been around for a long time. If you're a fancy politician from Washington, you wear a powdered wig, singing Yankee Doodle Dandy all the way to the Capitol building. Balding men, women, or really anyone can wear a wig. It's, it's really for everyone. What I'm getting at is it's been around for a long time and we've come a long way. Given enough time and asked to tell the difference, I probably couldn't. I, I, really, I really couldn't point out a wig if, if you showed me. So we're getting really good at it these days. That being said, in the Victorian times, wigs were quite common and were fashioned with a peculiar substance. Lard, yes. Imagine every day of the week without proper baths or showers and living in close proximity to the Thames River. And you take a handful of pig lard and just slather that in your wig to style it. Put a gross sound effect in there, just gross sound, ugh. Do you imagine the smell? This is the most offensive hair crime since frosted tips in the early 2000s. Those were a big mistake too, I gotta say. Not, I had them, but it was. there's only one man who can pull that off. And he's in Flavortown, you know who I'm talking about. Number two, German helmets. 1914 was the end of the Victorian era and the beginning of the modern era. It's actually a very fascinating time. It's kind of like modern meeting the past, really cool. Well, fashion just doesn't mean civilian. Anyone who's ever spent time in the Marine Corps knows that they gotta look their best. Well, Marines. The Empire of Germany was no different in 1914, and a lot of German soldiers wore helmets with an ornamental spike, like a Koopa from Super Mario. I know you guys have seen the movies, you, you, you've seen them. Except the main issue here wasn't an overweight Italian plumber jumping on their heads, uh, but the war and the enemy itself. World War I was fought in a lot of trenches, so it's kind of awkward when you can see a bunch of little spikes moving up and around the enemy's trench. It's also kind of dangerous to have an extra piece on your helmet as you can get caught in weird places like barbed wire, and yes, if you're wondering, sometimes they were used in the absence of a good melee tool. Yeah, you'd be correct, sometimes they did. You gotta do what you gotta do. Oh, brutal. Number one, French uniforms. More World War I, but it's still Victorian. It counts, I promise. While the spiked helmets were a very bad idea, they were shortly phased out. They learned their lesson. However, the French stood up and said, no, 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 I have a worse idea. Also, shout out to France. You guys get a bad rap for the war, but it's really your war. You guys rocked it, man. You guys are the best. Love France. Anyway, the French uniforms were a little bit of a mistake. In a classic case of fashion over function, kind of the theme of this list, they wore very bright and blue-red uniforms. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but bright blue doesn't exactly blend into an environment, thus it made French soldiers a very easy target. Everything's like gray, black, and brown, and you're just wearing bright blue and red pants? Yeah, you're gonna, you're not gonna make it far, Chief. Oh, number 10, the cholera belt. This is just so silly to me. While the Victorian era seems like a long, long time ago, it's really only like three to four people ago. So yeah, your, your grandparents or maybe even your great grandparents could have experienced a life like this. As we all know, disease was rampant back then and, and thank God we're a little less gross now, am I right? Well, cholera was quite the tummy bug going around back then, causing upset stomach indigestion and the Oregon Trail's favorite, diarrhea. Ooh, no thanks. So the people of Victorian times came up with something that, well, wasn't only functional, but fashionable too. Very nice. The cholera belt was a piece of red fabric that was to be wrapped around the belly to keep you warm. 
That's because people thought having a cold belly caused cholera. Because yeah, that's, that's, that definitely gives you cholera. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's what it does. It's not. It's a, it's a sickness. It's a virus. Number nine, Shields Arsenic Green. For some reason, green was all the rage back in Victorian times. I'm not sure why. I'm personally not a fan of green, but except for the green screen. We love that. I know you guys can't see that, but I love, I love the green screen. When I was a paint mixer, sometimes people would bring up the wildest colors for me to mix, and they weren't for art projects. They were for walls. So weird, but I digress. There was a common color back then called Shields Green. It was made in a lab by a spooky, scary Swedish guy named Shield. Huh, go figure. This color was used in everything dresses, fabric, paint, you name it. The trouble is, it was a compound of copper and arsenic. Therefore, it was toxic and caused a lot of harm. It also had links to cancer. For example, when Napoleon was banished to St. Helena, the walls of the house he was staying in were painted with shades of shield. Eee, that's not good. Pretty sure he died of stomach cancer too, so there's a connection there. Number eight, beetle dresses. Like I said, the green color was really in at the time, and there were other ways of achieving such a gorgeous glow besides using shield paint. Similar to how Cleopatra made her eyeliner, some dresses in Victorian times were made with pieces of beetle. Ugh. I'm sure there are some folks out there who probably don't mind that, but for the rest of us that don't care for Halloween or My Chemical Romance and Tales from the Crypt Keeper, hard pass. Basically, any beetle or colorful bug that wings or I guess caprices was worth keeping was prepared and sewn into fabric. The finished product doesn't look like it came from creepy crawlies. It actually looks kind of good, to be honest. Mind you, this is a time when a lot of things were still done by hand, so there's a little bit of love in each beetle you stitch. That's kind of nice. Mom, mom helped out with that one. That was nice. Number seven, wearing black for weeks. Losing a family member is tough. Life can get hard. In Victorian times, passing away was a big deal. There was usually a big funeral, flowers, tears, everything. Thing. The whole works. The crazy part is, you were expected to wear black or mourning clothes, as they were called, thought to be an outward expression of one's emotions and feelings. However, it's not like that one funeral of the distant uncle you had, where as soon as you got home, you ripped off your suit and hopped on Call of Duty to see what your friends are doing. Oh, on the contrary, my ninja diffusing friends, because in Victorian times, your search and destroy matches would require you to wear those black mourning clothes for a long time, sometimes even weeks and months on end. Queen Victoria wore hers for years after her husband been passed and it was odd to see her in anything but black. That's a weird story. That's crazy. Number six, Annaline Dye. In 1856, William Henry Perkin was trying to create an anti-malaria drug using aniline. After all, the British were spending an awful lot of time in foreign nations doing as the British do and needed a cure to keep doing what they do. Well, he did not find a cure for malaria, but he did discover it makes a very lovely dye that makes deep reds, purples, and black. You need that for the funerals. Naturally, this picked up a lot of steam and began to be used in everything from socks to shoe polish. Yeah, I know, right? Trouble is, once people got enough exposure to the clothing with aniline dyed, their skin would go red, itchy, inflamed, and was known for causing really bad headaches. That's because it would absorb their skin and poison their blood. That sounds pretty <laughs> Actually, I don't, I don't want that. Number five, zinc chlorine coats. This one's bad, man, but it was stopped before it became a trend. Thank God. Picture this. It's Victorian London, and you're but a humble city servant. Your job is to clean the streets. One night, it begins to rain, as it is known to do in England. I hear it rains there a lot. I don't know. And the city provides these humble men with coats that have a zinc chloride layer in the fabric. It was supposed to protect against rain and, and wetness and whatnot. A lot of chemistry in this video, but... Some might already guess that this was a bad idea. Zinc chloride is not only corrosive, but water soluble. So after a shift in the rain, a lot of these men came back with really nasty chemical burns. And no, they didn't have emergency showers like in Heisenberg's RV. They didn't have that. Or your high school chemistry class it was really bad. They stopped it immediately because that's really bad. Number four, asbestos fabrics. Crystal like this, he'll remember these. Picture this, it's 2004. It's Saturday afternoon and your dad just got finished watching an episode of Trucks. Nice. And now you have control over the TV remote. Saturday morning cartoons, here we come. I used to love the Kirby show. He's one of my favorites. Love that guy. But just before you change the channel, there's a commercial with an old man who looks very concerned and he says have you been affected by mesothelioma and or because of exposure to asbestos then you may be qualified for compensation I believe it went something like that maybe I should call Saul Goodman 
where's he when you need him? All jokes aside, those commercials were not joking. They weren't joking around at all because it's been known asbestos was very harmful for a long time. So yeah, it was pretty bad. Victorian times were no different, mostly using things to protect from heat or fire. And while it did do the job somewhat, it was very harmful for the lungs. And like the old man says in the commercial, it could be cancerous, hence mesotheliomia. I, can't, I said it right there. I said it the first time when I was impress impersonating him, and now I can't say it. Mesothelioma. There it is. Mesothelioma. Number three, radium makeup. Okay, sure. I'll give you that radiation and radioactive materials were pretty much being discovered and barely understood for the time. Okay, sure. It was new. Look at Madame Curie. Tragic story there. So when the very interesting radium was discovered, it got thrown into everything because, yeah, why not? Radium makeup, radium watches, you name it, radium was in it. While at first exposure to radium, you'd be fine, not too much to worry about. However, after years of direct physical contact on the skin, yikes, there's going to be a problem. It's radioactive. It's the reason why you shouldn't get too many x-rays. Not that it's radium, I'm just saying radiation in general is not good for you. Not much to explain in this one, except it was used and manufactured in women's makeup, and they used it, and I... I'm sorry, that's just, that's just rough. Number two, mercury hats. Mercury was nothing new in the medical field in Victorian times. It had been used in ancient China for a long time before that. And yes, it was poisonous. It was harmful to you. However, in Victorian times, some hats included mercury in their production process. Now, why is that so bad? Well, because mercury makes you go insane. Hence why they called it Mad Hatter's Disease. I could not think of a worse name for a disease. Now, not that it's a fashion point, but this was also readily used for treating syphilis at the time. So something that's readily available for the public and health would wind up in closed production. It makes sense. If there's a lot of it, sure, it makes a lot of sense. But it makes people go crazy. That's... Sorry, who's talking to me? What? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> joke, funny. Number one, cellulose nitrate. This one's crazy. As you can tell on this list, there's been a lot of clothes and fabrics mixed with some naughty chemicals. Naughty. Of course, this is years before OSHA or Wemyss, so it probably wouldn't happen today. However, this one takes the cake. When cotton, or a cotton-like product, is introduced to nitric acid, it forms cellulose nitrate, which is also known as flash cotton. Not because it takes its shirt off at an edgy concert, but because I cannot stress this enough how unstable and flammable it really is. Even the slightest heat source could set it off. There's even stories of people spontaneously combusting after being exposed to items made with such. The lights in the studio, they'd probably set it off. That's how, that's how sensitive it is. That's pretty crazy. Starting our list off at number 10, the first postage stamp. Uh, uh, uh. Nice. Who's the first guy who licked the stamp? Why'd he do it, right? We'll start off with stamp facts. Why not? I know there's a couple pen pals out there that still use snail mail. That's cool. This one's for you. May 1st, 1840, the world's first ever postage stamp was sold, of course, for one penny. Pretty cheap, nice, we love it. The sale changed history. Now on the stamp was of course a portrait of one Queen Victoria, world's first ever profile photo for a letter. Here we go, they're like, oh, who's this? Who's this little person here? Of course this caught on, definitely caught on. More than 70 million letters were sent within the next year. And then that tripled only a few years later. And of course it thrived for 40 years. Do you still use letters? If so, write into us, write some fan mail. Forget the comments, write into us with a pen, with your autograph too, where you live. Yeah, no one's doing that anymore. Number nine, Alexander Graham Bell. I have no idea how phones work. I know it's vibrations and signals and I have to do this occasionally to help it out, but scientifically, nothing. I can't wrap my brain around this technology. Still, I'm 28 years old and I have YouTube, couldn't tell you. If I was sent back in time right now, I wouldn't beat Alexander Graham Bell. I would just watch him and wouldn't change history one bit. Guy's a wizard. On March 7th, 1876, Alexander Graham Bell received a patent on his invention the telephone, and just three days later, he made it work, somehow. The world's first phone call was of course to his assistant, Thomas Watson. Now I'm from the generation that had T9, and I thought that was bad. I also didn't have that, you know, one of these, where you have to like, go around and around a bunch of times. T9 was way worse than anything. You have to Morse code message all your friends. Ugh, we have it too easy today. Never forget about Alexander Graham Bell. Hit that thumbs up on your smartphone for Alexander Graham Bell. How? How does it work? Hello? Number eight, Queen Victoria's death. You may have heard the phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Sounds very Westeros, doesn't it? Sounds like the British Empire is in an alternate universe or something, I don't know. But this is meant in a literal sense. 
On January 22, 1901, the Victorian era came to a close, of course, after the death of Queen Victoria herself. She passed away at age 81, and Queen Victoria was succeeded by her oldest son, King Edward VII. Now, at this time, the British Empire literally took up more than one fifth of all of Earth's land. So the sun actually did not set on the British Empire. It's a real phrase, it's not just a fun bit there. Number seven, Queen Victoria's eighth child. First of all, eighth. Kudos. Here's a fact that we don't talk about enough. Let's do this. First of all, I have no idea what it's like to give birth. I hear the comparisons and what it feels like, whatever, and it makes me want to faint. It's like peeing a watermelon or something like that. It's, I'm gonna faint just talking about it. The fact that you can endure this pain is beyond me. And the fact that you want to as well, Kudos. Now imagine being the queen and having the public, like everybody, talk smack about you and how you decide to give birth for the eighth time. Yeah, April 7th, 1853, Queen Victoria decided to use chloroform as an anesthetic delivery. Now everybody at this point that, you know, wasn't a scientist, they were sure to voice their opinions on the matter. It was a huge controversy, although this act directly spread the awareness of this medical advancement. I mean, yeah, it sounds, you know, they're like, yeah, don't do that. But can you do that? We don't really know. We're eating bread. Number six, grave bells. Oh, this one gives me chills. Here we go. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, and anything and everything was spreading. It was not an ideal time, wasn't very safe. Many were biting the bullet at this time, sadly, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark trend, the safety coffin. Yeah. Just the backup coffin. These coffins, Lord forbid you are buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Nice, like it's Michael Jackson's thriller. They would just come up and be like, oh, oh, oh guess who's back? Back in the Thames, here we go. All these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and a wire. This wire ran through the coffin and then attached to a bell on the outside, on the you know ground floor. So if a passerby or heard it, well, thy would know something's up. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. I mean, you know, they'd personalize it. Like for example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He passed in 1791, but instructed his family and watchmen to open this special door that would reveal a layer of glass. So that's real haunting to find. Hey, come look at grandpa. Yeah, he looks good, eh? Patent number 81,437. It was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868, and it was an improved burial case. Just a glass case with someone who may or may not be alive inside. 50-50. It had an air inlet, a ladder, and of course, a bell. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, they can ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save themselves from premature death by being buried alive. So now I ask you, if you're walking in a graveyard and you heard a bell ringing, what, would you just start digging and be like, ah, I think I heard something. I don't know. Let's just disrupt this skeleton. Number five, gym day. Believe it or not, they were around 200 gyms all across Europe during Victorian times. Dudes were getting shredded. Why not? They're like, hey, we don't have dinner, but might as well just work out. These gyms weren't bright. They weren't open. They weren't well ventilated, motivating, safe. None of those things that you need today. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class. Uh, yes, of course. Grab your pocket watch and your blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing some bench pressing today, I guess. Yeah, grab your monocle for sure. You're gonna need that. These machines also, they were not ideal to work out. They were designed as antiques first, rather than, you know, their fitness purpose and safety purpose also. Like, half these look like saw traps. There's no way I'm gonna be bending my arm around any of these Victorian devices. Even the machines today at the gym, I'm like, no way, no thank you. Weak gang, here we go. Number four, beauty patches. Okay, we have to bring back beauty patches ASAP. Imagine like if a rapper had a beauty patch. Nelly had the band-aid, but we gotta have like beauty patches. We gotta like, you know, mix it up a bit. Bring back the facial feature game. These patches came in all shapes and sizes, of course, in the Victorian era. Even in this portrait from 1755, Joshua Reynolds painted Charles, the ninth Lord Cathcart, rocking a large beauty patch. That looks amazing. He does look like Nelly, honestly. He has like that motivational, like rapper kind of like, you know, he, he's, he's in charge and you can tell from the beauty patch. It's like that that's a lord right there with that one of those. Take it off, no lord. Put it back on, lord. The reason for these patches back then and sometimes having more than one is because they were commonly used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk, velvet, and they were applied with glue. So pick a spot and commit. It's gonna be there all day. These patches were dark black and they were meant to make your pale skin pop. Of course, pale skin back then made everyone faint. Pale, pale skin and long shoes, everyone's losing their minds. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. How funny is that? Historian Joseph Addison took note of these positions when he observed two parties from the 1800s. Now, one party had patches on the right side and the other 
had the opposite. It's pretty, pretty amazing. It's a pretty easy way to flip jerseys, right? The other team starts winning, you're like, you know what? Check it out, now I'm on this side, prove it. Number three, chimney sweep. Ah, terrible jobs, here we go. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house and I loved it, I thought it was cool. I thought it was like a little safety, like secret room, I don't know. It wasn't safe at all, actually. It was just a dirty room. Had a little broom too. I always loved using that little broom. Little tiny sweeps, one at a time. Little tiny bag to go along with it, so gentle. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young as well. I can't say anything else there, but these guys were Young lads, history is horrible. Maybe that's why I was doing it, right? Because I could fit inside of the thing, that makes sense. 1840 was a good year, all things considered. A law was passed that made it illegal for anybody under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea, I could have used this great law and got out of the whole chore, shame. Number two, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, who is he? How did he get away with it? And also, when are we gonna see a Netflix documentary on this guy? We have everybody else in this multiverse of killers. Where's this guy? Gonna complete the image. Well, it's because we didn't find him. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily, and sadly, he would target sex workers at the time. He famously took the lives of five women from August to November of 1888, and they were believed to have been connected to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active until 1891. It's hard to tell who's who and who's doing what. Again, this is also so long ago. There's no cameras hard to catch someone. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims as well, which is creepy. While there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was never identified, so. Yeah, that sucks, really. We gotta find him. Can't, but we gotta. And finally, number one, mudlarks. Yeah, we'll get dirty for this last one here, why not? Victorian London around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Everyone was sick, a lot of sore throats, to say the least. The jobs that were available, they sucked. They certainly didn't help you, you know, survive. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. Now, as the name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the mud and muck that would build up alongside the Thames River. Yeah, that dirty river back then. They're like, yeah, just go through the, the lining of that. See what's in there. Ugh. This one was reserved, again, for the younger folk with, you know, the, uh, the, the patellas that still worked, you know, digging in the mud, of course. Can't have an old guy in there. He's not gonna come back out. It was like working in quicksand. It was horrible. It was exhausting. Not to mention the chances of being whisked away by the river at any given moment. Yeah, it sucked. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch or some driftwood, rags, something, anything really worth your troubles. Number 10 on the countdown is the cat's meat man or woman. We all know that the Egyptians worship cats, as many cultures do. But did you know that the cat overpopulation in the 1800s London area created a job called cat meat sellers. Always one of the most popular street sellers of the 1800s. If you think they sold cat meat, you're entirely wrong. Don't worry. These vendors were actually selling meat to cats themselves. Primarily horse, it was said that 26,000 horses that were maimed or passed their workability were slaughtered a year for London's reportedly 300,000 street cats that were existing in the 1860s. When the cat's meat seller appeared, feline owners were encouraged by their cats mewing to bestow upon their favorite pet, a delectable treat for a mere half penny. You may be wondering how this could be one of the worst jobs to have. Well, pushing around a hot stinking cart of horse meat has its cons, such as disease and rot. Depending on where you sold, you could be making a fortune or you could be barely scraping by. The hungry and homeless would often follow, harass, and sometimes burglarize cat meat sellers for meat or money. Also, their stalking behavior did scare off clientele or drew more complaints from the commoners. Personally, I couldn't think of something cuter than a little trolley going around town delivering food to kittens. Prepare to go downhill, however, because this next job is a lot less lighthearted than cat meat delivery. At number nine in our countdown is the resurrectionists. Money was tight for many, as I had mentioned, but how low are you willing to go as a person to get what you need? Well, if you're willing to dig up somebody's grandma, it could put hundreds in your coin purse. In the early 19th century, the only cadavers available to medical schools and anatomists were that of executed criminals. It was also mandatory for medical students to do an autopsy to graduate, and they had to source their own body. This demand for bodies was often unmet, resulting in medical schools and their students offering extreme amounts of money for the delivery of a fresh body. Thus, resurrectionists are born. Sneaking into cemeteries at night, they would prowl around for a fresh grave site and then dig up the recently deceased. However, bodies could only be sold if they were within a certain time period of freshness. And as grave robbing became more common, many family members of the recently deceased would take turns standing guard for nights in a row to ensure that the body lay undisturbed until 
until it was considered unsalvageable for cash. In 1832, the Anatomy Act was imposed due to the actions of William Burke and William Hare, who are believed to have murdered 16 people between 1827 and 1828, just one year, all to sell to the University of Edinburgh. This act did give doctors and anatomists greater access to cadavers and allowed people to leave their bodies to medical science, overall helping end the resurrectionists era. While sourcing the dead may make for a fat paycheck, I think this is a profession nobody should attempt to resurrect. Speaking of the dead, have you ever considered eating off their lap? Okay, well, not quite literally off their lap, but number eight on the countdown is sin eaters. Sin eating is a job that really only affects you if you have a discomfort with death or a religious slash spiritual. It was believed that when someone religious was to die after a life led of sins, such as gluttony, lust, pride, or crimes and cruelty towards others, their family would sometimes feel that the only way to guarantee their loved ones access to heaven is through someone living taking on the weight of their sins. While the act is against the church's wishes, sin eaters go back as far as the 17th century. Depending on the family or the deceased, the meal served may be specific, but traditionally it was just a piece of bread. Placed on the chest of the laid out body, it was believed to supposedly suck up the sins of the dead, clearing them for a passage to heaven. Once the sins had been captured in the bread, the sin eater would sit on a stool facing the door and eat the bread before washing the bread down with a bowl of ale. Because he was a man who would willingly take on the sins of other people, he was often solitary in the community. However, sin eaters fetched a pretty fair price for the act. I mean, if it is true that you're taking on someone else's bad karma, you'd at least want to be compensated for that, right? Sin eating remained popular in England and Wales all the way to the turn of the 20th century when England's last sin eater, Richard Munslow, died in Rattling Hope in 1906. Like sin eaters, our next job was one of public scrutiny and rejection. Number seven is mudlarking. Victorian mudlarks are the original foragers of the foreshore. They would be scavenging for anything on exposed riverbed which they could sell in order to survive. This was the last ditch resort. People would hike up trousers and wade their feet around in sludge, feeling with toes as well as fingers for items that may be lost or discarded in the mud. All ages participated in this activity. However, it was usually those who were the most affected by poverty that were taking part. As a result, those seen mudlarking were considered shameful and the lowest of society. River Thames was the most famous for mudlarking in the Victorian era, as it was renowned dumping ground that saw endless amounts of product travel through it. It was also a highly impoverished area, which made the desperation to make money all the more grand, filling their water banks with the poor. Mudlarking actually isn't out of practice nowadays, but it has changed significantly. Nowadays it can be a fun group or solo activity that on occasion does require a permit. You can join mudlarking groups or do tours while traveling. It seems that sifting through garbage was an unfortunate trend in the Victorian era as toshers make number six in our countdown. Toshers, a fun word to say, the job, not so much. Unlike mudlarking, which was in the riverbeds, these workers went underground for their winnings. The Victorian era saw the development of sewer systems, and the poor saw opportunity in them. Toshers descended into the sewers to sift through raw sewage and find any valuable that may have fallen down the drains. It was extremely dangerous work, as noxious gas fumes formed deadly airless pockets, and since sewers were newer, the tunnels frequently crumbled from inefficient building. There were swarms of rats that had little fear of humans, and at any moment the sluices might just open for a fresh wave of filthy water and feces to come crashing through. After 18 1940, it did become illegal to enter the sewers without permission. Rather than abandon the trade, toshers began working late at night or early in the morning to avoid detection. It may have been a stinky job, but it was also one of the most profitable on our list today. I guess you'd go nose blind after a little bit. Right? Hopefully. On a warm summer day, the last thing you want after jumping into the lake on your cabin trip is to emerge covered in leeches. However, in the Victorian era, that would be a prime location for the leech collectors, which are coming in at number 5 on our worst jobs countdown. Leeches are nowadays seen as little more than slimy and creepy creatures, but believe it or not, they used to be a valuable commodity in the fields of beauty and medicines. This job was often fulfilled by poor women living in the country and farmland regions. Wearing shorts or hefting up their long skirt, these women would wade into dirty ponds and waterbeds alike with exposed legs so as to tempt the leeches. When enough leeches were attached to them, the women would climb back out of the pool and scrape the blood suckers into metal pots and bowls. Seeing as leeches can survive up to a year without food or in their natural environment, this wasn't always a profitable trade unless you could find someone in dire or consistent need of leeches. Doctors did use leeches to aid in the curing process of all sorts of conditions, ranging from a stomach ache to joint pain to female hysteria, if you know what I'm talking. 
talking about. Despite being used in medicine, leech collection posed major threats of deadly diseases and blood loss to their collectors. Suffice to say, I don't think I have any interest in going to a doctor's office if I'm going to be prescribed a leeching. Being given the duty of helping prevent and stop the spread of disease in your community would be an incredibly high honor. But maybe wait to sign that job contract until you hear the details. Nightmen definitely make it into our worst jobs countdown, taking the place at number 4. These men would wander the streets at night working what may be one of the most revolting jobs imaginable, collecting human feces off the street for proper disposal. They would dig up the feces from chamber pots, street wells, ditches, sewer holes, you name it. By the time the sun would begin to rise, the carts would be full of the city's excrement, which would then be carried off and reused as fertilizers for the crop that they later consumed. Yummy. Part of being one of the only people up at night means you're a valuable set of eyes. There are reports of nightmen catching burglars or SA in the act, or being called to bloody scenes by members of the public to provide alibis. There is also hundreds of cases where nightmen are the ones to find bodies of those who had met their ends out on the street. After long, solitary nights of collecting feces and seeing these crimes unfold, a nightman would collect his 23 shillings, which is $75 today, at the end of the week and go home to rest before starting it all over again. Since we're already discussing dung, let's get this next one out of the way because it somehow may genuinely be a little bit worse than the last. At number 3, this is the Pure Finders. Please do not be deceived by the name because this job is anything but pure. In the Victorian era, tanners, who are leather workers, would use dog dung in their practice. Referred to as pure for how it purified the leather and ensured its soft flexibility, dog dung became a hot commodity due to the Victorian demand for leather. Leather was being used for just about anything as it was the hottest trend of this era. It was also being used for things like tack for horses and the necessary creation of shoes and books. To meet demands, tanners needed more dog dung, and so pure finding became a career. These finders would go deep into the cities and their sewers, trying to find where stray dog packs amassed so they could score the biggest load. Whenever dung was found, it'd be retrieved and placed into a covered bucket that would later be sold to a tanner. To make it a little worse for you guys, only some collectors wore a glove to protect protect their dung handling hand. But others considered it harder to keep a glove clean than a hand and they opted out of the protection altogether. Yeah, think about that one. I feel like if this next job didn't exist, then maybe we wouldn't have needed the cat meat sellers from our first point in the countdown. Considered one of the most disease riddled jobs of the Victorian era, it's rat catchers coming in second on our list today. The government was smart. It knew its people were suffering and that many were starving and struggling to make ends meet. So they issued a statement willing to pay people to deal with the rat infestations. Every rat would earn people a little extra cash. If someone could catch more than 5,000 rats in a year, they'd earn special privileges. While 5,000 sounds like it would be a lot, it's essentially 13 per day, and it only takes 21 to 23 days for a rat to give birth to its litter. I think you can do the math. It's said that the government's encouragement of rat catching in this time was the stepping stones towards more plague and diseases to come, as desperate poverty driven people made poor attempts to catch these rats and caught the illnesses from them. Others cheated the rules. Some people actually intentionally bred rat colonies to supplement their captured rodents. Rat catching became such a lucrative business that gangs formed around it. And murders even took place when the cheaters were discovered or if somebody infiltrated somebody else's ratting territory. Between the venomous competition and high risk of disease resulting in death, it's safe to say that rat catching may have been one of the worst jobs. And now, what may be the worst of the worst for number one slot, let's learn about the history of matchmakers. No, this isn't the romantic kind of matchmaking unfortunately, but it's rather the business of matches itself. Working what was often a 14 hour shift, matchmakers were predominantly women who were immigrants, living in poverty, widowed, just overall in a bad situation for an era where women had pretty much zero rights. They were compensated poorly, often sexually or assaulted by their management, and even forced to pay fines to their workplace should they be tardy or damage anything they worked on. Working with white phosphorus, the material found in the tip of the match to enable the instant strike anywhere effect, was highly toxic and responsible for a devastating disease known as Fossy Jaw. This nickname was given by the matchmakers to the particularly nasty condition that would cause the jawbone to rot and become disfigured. Eventually this infection would spread to the brain and cause debilitating symptoms and extreme pain prior to death.
death. Should the jawbone be removed in time, some women were able to survive longer with the condition, but nothing was guaranteed once Fossey Jaw had set in. Famously, an article written by a matchstick girl named Annie Besant exposed the conditions of matchstick companies in London. Infuriated, the factory owners fired her and attempted to force signatures of their other staff, stating that they were happy with their working lives. Refusing to do so, by the end of day, 1,400 women had gone out on strike. Their demands were eventually met, but only 20 years later. It wasn't until 1906 that white phosphorus was made illegal in the use of matchsticks in the UK. The matchstick girls were a revolutionary step towards the deliverance of women's rights and autonomy, a journey that we're still on today.